10, 9, ignition sequence. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. Our mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and has come to a final stop. Der Streit zwischen Syrien und der Türkei verschärft sich weiter. Beide Staaten haben ihren Luftraum für Flugzeuge aus dem Nachbarland gesperrt. Syrien verhängte die Sperre zuerst, als Reaktion darauf, dass die türkische Luftwaffe am vorigen Mittwoch eine syrische Passagiermaschine zur Landung gezwungen hatte. An Bord wurden angeblich Radarbauteile aus Russland gefunden. In den Hochburgen der syrischen Opposition dauern die Kämpfe an. Das Schafviertel in der ehemaligen Wirtschaftsmetropole Aleppo, kurz nach einem verheerenden Artillerieangriff der syrischen Armee. Unser Haus, weint dieser Junge, meine Schwester. Ganze Straßenzüge zerstört, die Menschen in Panik. In der Provinz Idlib haben die Aufständischen, diesem Internetvideo zufolge, wiederum einen Kampfjet abgeschossen, offenbar eine russische MiG. Die Hoheit über den syrischen Luftraum wird immer mehr zum bestimmenden Machtfaktor. Militärisch, aber auch politisch im Konflikt mit der Türkei. Das syrische Staatsfernsehen verkündete in seinen Nachrichten, alle Flüge türkischer Airlines über syrischem Staatsgebiet zu verhindern. Das Regime reagierte damit auf die erzwungene Landung eines syrischen Passagierflugzeugs in der Türkei, das nach türkischen Angaben Rüstungsteile transportiert hatte. Die Spannungen zwischen der Türkei und Syrien nehmen zu. Dass Syrien gefährliche Streubomben einsetzt, Menschenrechtler hatten die schon früher behauptet. Heute legte Human Rights Watch belastende Videoaufnahmen vor. Streubomben verteilen großflächig kleinere Sprengkörper und sind international geächtet. Die syrische Regierung sollte diese gefährlichen Waffen ab sofort nicht mehr einsetzen. Sie sollte Streumunition aus den Gebieten entfernen, in der diese verwendet wurde. Und sie sollte die Bevölkerung darüber informieren, wie gefährlich diese Waffen sind. Weil Streubomben nicht sofort explodieren, so Human Rights Watch, stellen sie vor allem für spielende Kinder auch nach Monaten eine große Gefahr dar. Die Außenminister der EU beschäftigen sich heute Abend in Luxemburg ebenfalls mit dem Syrien-Konflikt. An dem Treffen nimmt auch ihr russischer Amtskollege Lavrov teil. Die EU kritisiert die Haltung Russlands im UN-Sicherheitsrat. Moskau hat bisher zusammen mit der chinesischen Regierung eine schärfere Gangart gegen die syrische Führung verhindert. Vor der Zusammenkunft warnte Lavrov vor einer Internationalisierung des Konflikts. Die Beziehungen Russlands zur Türkei sieht er durch die erzwungene Landung der syrischen Maschine nicht belastet. Zum Stand der Gespräche jetzt live aus Luxemburg, Rolf-Dieter Krause. Die europäischen Außenminister haben sich hier mit ihrem russischen Kollegen ziemlich eingeigelt, aber ein Durchbruch wird es natürlich nicht geben. Vor den Wahlen in den USA rechnen weder Russen noch Europäer mit einem erneuten internationalen Vorstoß zur Lösung der Krise. Dass der Konflikt in Syrien immer mehr Söldner und Extremisten anzieht, diese Sorge des Russen werden auch seine europäischen Kollegen teilen. Einigermaßen erleichtert werden Sie hören, dass Russland den Konflikt mit der Türkei über das zur Landung gezwungene syrische Flugzeug tiefer hängen will. Die Türkei, so sagte Lavrov, hier, habe das Recht zur Kontrolle der Ladung gehabt, aber die Ladung sei legal gewesen. Der russische Besitzer würde sie nur gern zurückhaben und das könne durchaus etwas schneller geben. Und auch der erstmal verschobene Besuch des russischen Präsidenten Putin in der Türkei solle schon in wenigen Wochen nachgeholt werden. Es war einer der brenzlichsten Momente im Kalten Krieg. Nur wenige Funken hätten noch gefehlt und es wäre zu einer verhängnisvollen Kettenreaktion gekommen. Buchstäblich. Während der sogenannten Kuba-Krise stand die Welt so nah wie bis dahin noch nie am Rande eines Atomkriegs. Die UdSSR unter Khrushchev hatte Nuklearraketen auf Kuba stationiert. US-Präsident Kennedy wollte die Provokation quasi vor seiner Haustür nicht hinnehmen. Den Verdacht, dass die Sowjetunion die Raketen auf der kommunistischen Karibikinsel stationieren wollte, den hatten die Amerikaner schon länger gehabt. Aber heute, vor genau einem halben Jahrhundert, kam die Bestätigung dann aus der Luft, erinnert Stefan Niemann. Amerikanische Aufklärungsflugzeuge entdecken und fotografieren sie, sowjetische Atomraketen heimlich stationiert auf Kuba. 
Nikita Khrushchev rüstet den Karibikstaat Fidel Castros auf, angeblich um eine US-Invasion abzuwenden, für Washington eine Provokation. John F. Kennedy will die Bedrohung aus Amerikas Hinterhof nicht hinnehmen. So beginnt heute vor 50 Jahren ein Nervenkrieg, 13 Tage der Angst vor einer atomaren Auseinandersetzung der Supermächte. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev. Ich appelliere an Ministerpräsident Khrushchev, die unbesonnene und provozierende Bedrohung des Weltfriedens und der Beziehungen zwischen unseren Ländern zu beenden. Ich rufe ihn ferner auf, das Streben nach Weltherrschaft aufzugeben und sich am historischen Bemühen zu beteiligen, das gefährliche Wettrüsten zu beenden und die Geschichte der Menschheit zu wandeln. Es gibt noch kein rotes Telefon, keinen direkten Draht zwischen dem Kreml und dem Weißen Haus. Austausch und Übersetzung diplomatischer Depeschen dauern ewig, Botschaften kreuzen sich, es kommt zu Missverständnissen. Die Militärs drängen Kennedy zum Angriff auf Kuba, doch der Präsident hat andere Pläne. Er verhängt eine Seeblockade. Um das Aufrüsten aufzuhalten, werden wir alle Lieferungen von Offensivwaffen an Kuba stoppen. Die US-Streitkräfte in höchster Alarmbereitschaft, mehr als Säbelrasseln der Supermächte. Die Welt hält den Atem an, aus Angst vor einem Atomkrieg. Der impulsive Fidel Castro rät den Sowjets in einem Brief sogar zum nuklearen Erstschlag gegen die USA. Erst nach quälenden zwei Wochen kann der Konflikt entschärft werden. Die Geschichtsbücher feiern John F. Kennedy als klugen Krisenmanager. Neue Dokumente belegen erst jetzt, sein Bruder Bobby hat den Sowjets zugesichert, US-Atomraketen aus der Türkei abzuziehen. Erst nach dieser Zusicherung lässt Khrushchev seine Raketen auf Kuba abbauen und zurücktransportieren. Und die Welt atmet auf. This is Mission Control. Houston, welcome to today's ISS Update. It is Monday, October 15th, uh, 2012. This is a live view inside the Space Station Flight Control Room here at the Johnson Space Center. Right now, Clay Anderson, the uh, Capcom, is talking with the crew up on board the station and giving them some instructions about some repair work they're going to be doing. Standing beside him is Bob Dempsey, the uh, flight director. The uh, crew is very busy today working on a variety of different experiments, unloading some cargo from the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. Yuri Malinchenko is working on what's called the relaxation experiment. This is uh, not what it sounds like. This is actually an experiment that observes the Earth below and takes a look at chemical reactions in the upper reaches of the atmosphere. He is also getting ready to do some uh, leak checks on some of the valves in the Russian segment. Sonny Williams, who is the current commander of Expedition 33, is working on some air quality monitoring. They do this from time to time just to make sure that uh, the air aboard the station is acceptable. They also sample the uh, surfaces there uh, from time to time. She's going to be working on replacing the water processor assembly pump, which is what uh, the crew is talking with now uh, with the ground controllers. She's also configuring some software on the Express laptop computers. This is one of the uh, laptops on board that helps maintain and run all the different uh, experiment racks inside. She's going to be transferring some samples from the Melfi-1. This is one of the minus 80 laboratory freezers that is on board that uh, keeps samples at uh, extremely cold temperatures to uh, what's called the uh, Glacier, which is another uh, basically just a freezer for different samples. She's also going to be working with what is called the Micro-6 experiment. This is something that uh, was flown up on board the uh, SpaceX Dragon. It's one of the newest experiments on board. Uh, it takes a look at uh, a certain kind of yeast uh, that is present in pretty much everybody's body. Uh, this uh, yeast that's called Candida albicans helps us maintain uh, a healthy uh, personal ecosystem inside ourselves. But when our immune systems get stressed, uh, this yeast can start uh, sort of growing out of control and cause infections. So they're going to be taking a look at how these yeast grow in space uh, compared with how they grow here on Earth. The hope is that scientists on the ground can learn how to combat infections because as we look to go further into space, spend more time uh, both in low Earth orbit and also uh, as we look toward going to an asteroid, maybe Mars one of these days, controlling infections is going to be really important. So they're going to take a look at how this yeast behaves in space and how they can combat uh, infections using this yeast as an example. In addition to the Micro-6, Aki Hoshide, another member of Expedition 33, is working on uh, some medical experiments, including one that takes a look at energy levels up on board the station. What they do is examine uh, what the astronauts eat, 
uh, basically taking a look at what they ingest in their bodies, and they record in very detailed form uh, exactly how they expend that energy. So basically taking a look at the uh, mathematical equation of how much energy goes in and how much energy the astronauts expend. The goal of this experiment is to determine exactly what the food requirements are for the astronauts uh, up on board the space station while they live up there uh, for about six months. He is also relocating another uh, piece of equipment from another experiment called Elite S2. Uh, this is an experiment that takes a look at posture and body motion, and uh, the astronauts put on different kinds of markers, almost like uh, how they do the movies these days in Hollywood, and it determines exactly what their body position is and records that through a series of cameras. Hoshide is also going to be recharging some of the batteries uh, in the spacesuits inside the Quest airlock. He's also going to be helping uh, Williams transfer those samples we talked about from the Melfi to uh, one of the uh, glaciers on board. He is also going to be transferring the glacier that flew up on board Dragon. This is an actual uh, big box that uh, we've talked about before during our Dragon coverage uh, that will eventually be returned to Dragon full of samples that have been on board the station and uh, those samples will finally come home after waiting for Dragon to arrive. That is uh, one of the biggest benefits that the SpaceX Dragon vehicle uh, gives us is the ability to actually return science from the International Space Station and bring it back for further research here on Earth. And finally, Aki Hoshide is going to be uh, taking a look at another uh, experiment that came up on board. The Dragon vehicle is called the Resist Tubule Experiment. This is a plant experiment that uh, takes a look at how different types of plants grow uh, up in space and the lack of gravity. 50% of the energy that uh, plants require goes into just maintaining their structure and just overcoming the battle uh, with gravity. But of course, up in space, uh, that is not a worry and not an issue. Those plants uh, do not have to uh, react to gravity. So they're going to take a look at the uh, actual cell structure of these plants as they grow uh, without the influence of gravity, uh, how they use that energy, and uh, it will impact uh, genetically modified plants and other things like that here on Earth. Uh, in the future. Of course, if you would like to take a look at any of these experiments and read more about them, uh, see some pictures of the astronauts and the crew members uh, working with these experiments, just log on to the NASA website at www.nasa.gov slash station. Once again, www.nasa.gov slash station and just click on Science and Research. Extremsportler Felix Baumgartner hat es geschafft. Der 43-jährige Österreicher hat seinen spektakulären Fallschirmsprung aus 39 Kilometern Höhe gut überstanden und dabei gleich drei Rekorde aufgestellt. Zunächst stieg er so hoch auf wie noch niemand zuvor mit einem Ballon. Von dort sprang er mit seinem Fallschirm ab. Im freien Fall kam er dann auf die Rekordgeschwindigkeit von mehr als 1340 Kilometern pro Stunde und durchbrach damit die Schallmauer. Die offizielle Anerkennung der Rekorde wird noch einige Wochen dauern. Millionen Menschen weltweit schauten sich Baumgartners Sprung live an. Die EU-Außenminister haben schärfere Sanktionen gegen Syrien und den Iran beschlossen. Teheran soll mit wirtschaftlichem Druck auf den Finanzsektor und die Ölindustrie dazu bewegt werden, über sein umstrittenes Atomprogramm zu verhandeln. Im Fall Syriens wurden die Konten von weiteren Unterstützern des Assad-Regimes gesperrt und ein europaweites Landeverbot gegen die staatliche Fluggesellschaft verhängt. Über lange Abendstunden hat Europas Außenminister mit ihrem russischen Kollegen diskutiert, aber über Syrien kamen sie sich nicht näher. Wir hatten einen Meinungsaustausch, aber wie schon seit vielen Monaten haben wir keine Übereinstimmung erzielt. Die Russland ist allerdings auch europaparteiisch. Gegen Syrien verhängte die EU heute weitere Sanktionen und ausdrücklich stellte sie sich an die Seite der Türkei. Die habe in jeder Hinsicht das Recht, Waffenlieferungen an Syrien über ihr Hoheitsgebiet zu verhindern. Eine Bewaffnung äh, über den eigenen Luftraum des syrischen Regimes Assad muss weder die Türkei akzeptieren noch irgendein anderer. Und was heißt dies für Waffen, die ebenfalls über die Türkei an die Rebellen geliefert werden? Wir wenden uns gegen Waffenlieferungen. Ich habe aber gleichzeitig gesagt, dass ich zu Spekulationen keine Stellung beziehen kann. Auch im Atomstreit mit dem Iran, Syriens wichtigstem Partner, verschärft Europa die Sanktionen. Sie sollen vor allem die Finanzquellen des Landes treffen. Dass die Sanktionen zu wirken beginnen, zeigt auch, dass eine politische und diplomatische Lösung 
möglich ist. Das ist vor allem eine Botschaft an Israel, das immer wieder mit Militärschlägen gegen iranische Nuklearanlagen droht. Auch Europa will nicht hinnehmen, dass der Iran sich atomar bewaffnet. Aber hier glaubt man, dass dies nur durch politische Lösungen nachhaltig zu verhindern ist. Die Bürger in Schottland dürfen über eine mögliche Unabhängigkeit von Großbritannien abstimmen. Der britische Premierminister Cameron und der Chef der schottischen Regionalregierung Salmond haben heute eine entsprechende Vereinbarung unterzeichnet. Danach soll das Referendum Ende 2014 stattfinden. Aktuellen Umfragen zufolge befürwortet derzeit weniger als ein Drittel aller Schotten die Unabhängigkeit vom britischen Königreich. Der frühere König von Kambodscha, Norodom Sihanouk, ist tot. Wenige Tage vor seinem 90. Geburtstag erlag er heute in Peking einem Herzinfarkt. Bis zu seiner Abdankung im Jahr 2004 hatte Sihanouk die Politik in Kambodscha mehr als sechs Jahrzehnte geprägt. Trotz seiner umstrittenen Rolle während der Herrschaft der Roten Khmer wurde er vom Volk geliebt und geachtet. Ein Leben voller Widersprüche. Er war beliebt, auch umstritten. Die französische Kolonialmacht machte Sihanouk schon im Alter von 19 zum König. Später führte er sein Volk in die Unabhängigkeit. Mit Chinas Kommunisten suchte er den Schulterschluss, stellte sich mit ihren Führern gegen die USA. Anfang der 70er stürzte ihn sein Militär. Es folgte Bürgerkrieg und Sihanouk paktierte anfangs mit den Roten Khmer, umarmte deren Führer Pol Pot, der sich aber als Schreckensherrscher entpuppte. My people, myself. Mein Volk und ich und viele im Westen glaubten, sagt Sianuk später, die Roten Khmer seien gute Patrioten. Niemand wusste, dass sie so schlecht waren. Als Vietnams Truppen die Roten Khmer verjagten, denen fast zwei Millionen Menschen zum Opfer gefallen waren, floh Sianuk ins Exil. Von dort engagierte er sich für Frieden. Anfang der 90er kehrte er wieder zurück, wurde erneut König. Seinen Sohn Siamoni segnete er als Nachfolger, als er 2004 abdankte. Im lange kriegsgeplagten Kambodscha galt er vielen als ein Symbol der Versöhnung. Die philippinische Regierung hat ein vorläufiges Friedensabkommen mit der größten muslimischen Rebellengruppe des Landes geschlossen. Damit könnte ein 40 Jahre währender bewaffneter Konflikt zu Ende gehen, der mehr als 100.000 Tote gefordert hat. Beide Seiten vereinbarten, dass in dem überwiegend katholischen Land eine autonome islamische Region gegründet wird. Zudem sollen die etwa 12.000 Rebellen ihre Waffen abgeben. Einige davon kündigten jedoch bereits an, ihren Kampf für Unabhängigkeit fortzusetzen. Einen Tag vor dem Weltmeisterschaftsqualifikationsspiel gegen Schweden bereitet sich die deutsche Fußballnationalmannschaft auf die Partie in Berlin vor. Im vierten Spiel der Gruppe C soll der vierte Sieg gelingen. Die Schweden mit ihrem Star Zlatan Ibrahimovic gelten als schwerster Gruppengegner. Ein paar Details gilt es noch zu klären. Grundsätzlich aber weiß die Mannschaft, worum es geht. Ein Sieg gegen Schweden. Es fehlte der angeschlagene Sami Khedira beim Abschlusstraining. Für ihn wird wohl Toni Kroos auflaufen, der gegen Irland zwei Treffer erzielte. Zurück im Kader ist wieder Philipp Lahm in Dublin noch gelb gesperrt. Für Joachim Löw ist die Qualifikation für die WM in Brasilien eine Pflichtaufgabe. Wir schauen nach vorne. Wir haben jetzt wieder neun Punkte in dieser Gruppe. Wir haben jetzt zuletzt, glaube ich, es ist 13. Spiel in einer Qualifikation am Hintereinander gewonnen. Wir sind die Nummer zwei der Welt. Bei dem Weltranglisten 21. hat sich Slatan Ibrahimovic in 83 Spielen für Schweden krumm gemacht. 34 Tore erzielt der Star in einer gewohnt lockeren skandinavischen Mannschaft, die aber nicht zu unterschätzen ist. Sie haben eine Manchmal etwas Mühe gegen die kleineren Nationen, das ist festzustellen, aber sie sind steigerungsfähig und sie steigern sich in großem Maße gegen die großen Nationen. Morgen Abend im Berliner Olympiastadion gilt dennoch das DFB-Team als klarer Favorit. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS Update. It is Tuesday, October 16th, 2012. You're looking at a live view inside the Space Station Flight Control Room here at the Johnson Space Center. This is the Orbit 2 team that is currently on duty. They are working with the Expedition 33 crew members on board the orbiting complex. Right now the space station is high above Turkey at an altitude of 263 miles. It is heading up toward the northeast over parts of uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, and parts of Asia. The crew is uh, very busy today working on a variety of different uh, experiment work and research work on board the orbiting complex. The commander of Expedition 33, Sonny Williams, uh, started off her morning working with the European Modular Cultivation System, or EMCS. 
She was opening up some of the gas module valves that are part of that uh, research uh, facility. This is a large incubator on board the space station that serves as uh, a growth chamber for different types of uh, small plants. That particular incubator can actually uh, simulate uh, different forces of gravity. It can either have no gravity like they do up in space, or it can have two times the gravity you would find here on Earth. And all that is designed to find out uh, what kind of effects uh, plants see while they're up in space uh, with the crew members. She also has a ham radio pass with a uh, school in Spain. Uh, she's also performing an acoustic survey of the space station environment. Uh, the ground teams here instruct the crew members throughout their time on board the space station to basically monitor their home, monitor the complex. They take a variety of different samples around the orbiting laboratory, including the sound environment, just to make sure that the sound levels with all of that uh, machinery and computers and uh, all the acoustics there are acceptable, so she will uh, send down the results of that uh, later on today. She also has uh, an onboard training uh, tag up, as we call it here at NASA, just a quick conference call with some of the ground controllers here in Houston as they get ready for the end of the SpaceX Dragon mission coming up at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the month. Sonny Williams, as well as Aki Hoshide, her fellow Expedition 33 crew member, were a key part of uh, capturing the Dragon uh, back last week and installing it toward the end of this month. Once that spacecraft is full of all the items that are going to come back home to Earth, uh, they will basically be reversing the process using the station's arm that you saw there on the outside of the station to grab onto Dragon once again to remove it from the space station and to send it on its way. So they're going to have uh, a conference call later on today with some of the ground controllers who will be working with them uh, on that. She as well as Aki Hoshide also today are uh, taking a look at some of the proposed procedures for the upcoming spacewalk that may, not, uh, that may take place toward the end of this month or the early part of November. Uh, as we speak here uh, today on ISS Update, the space station uh, program management team is meeting to uh, talk uh, exactly what will take place during that spacewalk, whether we're going to have one or two. But the main focus of uh, the procedures are to look at this ammonia leak that the team has seen uh, on the P6 radiator. The P6 truss is uh, one of the far out trusses out there on the left hand side of the station. Uh, there's an ammonia leak on part of the radiator there that has uh, increased here uh, recently. So they're going to uh, come up with a way for the crew members to go out there and mitigate that. And once the uh, space station program control board approves all of that, uh, we'll have information for you here on NASA television as well as on NASA.gov in terms of uh, what day that spacewalk will take place and exactly what will be involved in it. Aki Hoshide is uh, performing an analysis of some of the water on board the space station today. He is uh, setting up some radiation monitors uh, throughout the space station. As we talked about, Sunny Williams is doing some sampling of the uh, sound and the acoustics on board. Aki Hoshide is uh, setting up uh, some sensors that will measure over the next uh, several weeks what the radiation levels are. Uh, and that data will be downlinked to the ground teams as well. He is uh, changing out some batteries on some of the laboratory uh, systems on board. He's also working with what's called the Microbe 3 experiment, which takes a look at uh, bacteria inside the Kibo laboratory. That is the Japanese facility on board the station. Uh, that just takes a look at different fungi and bacteria that uh, are growing in there, things that the human eye can't see. And uh, that will help combat uh, things as we look toward going on longer space flights to an asteroid and on to Mars one day. Obviously, you want to have uh, as sterile of an environment as you possibly can uh, in your spaceship. As we mentioned, he's also going to be taking part in that uh, Dragon training conference call with the ground teams to figure out what the crew is going to be doing uh, once Dragon departs. And then Yuri Malenchenko, the uh, other flight engineer on board, is working in the Russian segment. He is uh, working on part of an experiment that looks at circadian rhythms. Obviously, most people here on Earth know what that is, where your body and how it reacts to daylight and nighttime. It's a little bit different whenever you're up in space and you see uh, more than a dozen sunrises and sunsets per day. Your body clock gets uh, thrown off a little bit, so they're going to be taking a look at that. He's going to be wearing some instrumentation over the next several hours as they monitor how his body reacts to uh, the space station environment. He's also going to be doing a fitness evaluation today, spending about an hour and a half on the treadmill inside 
the uh, Russian segment, obviously, an exercise is an important part of uh, the crew members daily activities down at the Baikonur Cosmodrome while the crew is up in space their fellow crew members that are going to be joining them as part of Expedition 33 Oleg Novitsky, Evgeny Torelkin and Kevin Ford which you see there are undergoing final preparations for their launch that launch is coming up on October 23rd at 5:51 a.m. Central Time that is 6:51 a.m. Eastern Time They'll be launching on a Soyuz rocket. Of course, we'll have live coverage here on NASA television, as well as of their docking two days later on October 25th. That docking is scheduled for 7.35 a.m. Central Time, 8.35 a.m. Eastern Time. Im US-Präsidentschaftswahlkampf treffen in der Nacht Amtsinhaber Obama und sein republikanischer Herausforderer Romney in einem zweiten Rededuell aufeinander. Beide Kandidaten hatten sich in sogenannten Debattencamps über mehrere Tage vorbereitet. Obama liegt nach neueren Umfragen knapp vor Romney. Beobachter halten das TV-Duell für möglicherweise wahlentscheidend. Die ARD überträgt live ab 2.50 Uhr deutscher Zeit. This is Mission Control Houston. We want to welcome you to today's ISS update. It is Wednesday, October 17, 2012. This is a live view inside the space station flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. On board the orbiting complex today, the crew of Expedition 33 is busy working on a number of different science experiments and also some uh, routine maintenance. They're also working inside the Quest airlock today. There you see Sonny Williams there on the right, who is the commander of Expedition 33, as well as Aki Hoshide, who is a flight engineer on board. They are inside Quest getting their spacesuits ready for uh, an upcoming spacewalk that will take place over the next uh, couple of weeks toward the end of October, early part of November. The uh, crew is going to be going outside to take a look at the P-6 radiator that is out there on the uh, far left-hand side of the station out there near the solar arrays. There are radiators out there that uh, circulate ammonia through them to keep all the electronics and all the equipment on board the space station cool. Uh, there is a leak on one of those radiators out there that the crew is going to be going out there to address and to mitigate and to install some jumpers to uh, take care of that. The exact uh, timing of that spacewalk will be approved by the space station program here shortly, and then we'll know exactly what day and what time we are targeting for the spacewalk. But in between now and then, the crew is already reviewing the procedures on board uh, for that spacewalk and also getting their equipment ready to go uh, to step outside. This will be the seventh spacewalk for Sonny Williams. It'll be the uh, third for Aki Hoshide. These two no strangers to uh, going outside conducting these spacewalks during their time on board the space station. In addition to this, Sunday Williams today has some uh, activities inside the Destiny Laboratory. She's going to be calibrating uh, one of the oxygen sensors on what's called the Compound Specific Analyzer. This is a tool that's used on board to analyze uh, the environment inside to make sure that there's no uh, compounds that are uh, not expected to be there, just to make sure that everything on board the space station is acceptable and uh, is a good living environment for the crew. She's going to be transferring some water from some water containers into a water storage tank. She's also going to be uh, deactivating some mixing tubes that came up as part of the NanoRax Module 9 experiment. This is a student experiment that flew, uh, flew last week on board the uh, SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, and the uh, crew is taking care of that. And, of course, those results will be returned to Earth at the end of the mission for the students to uh, analyze. Aki Hoshide is taking some samples uh, inside the Japanese laboratory, the Kibo laboratory of different microbes around there. We talked about this yesterday as part of a uh, microbial detection experiment and activity. Throughout their time on board the space station, the crews uh, take a lot of samples of the water, of the air, and also the surfaces just to make sure that there's no bacteria or fungus uh, growing there that's not to be expected. This does two things. It makes sure that the space station is uh, as clean as can be for the crew but it also uh, gathers data to study how these things grow inside the uh, space environment on the surfaces there, which is going to be incredibly important as we venture on longer journeys past the International Space Station to destinations like an asteroid or onto Mars. Yuri Malenchenko also working in the Russian segment. He's working on a couple of different Earth observatory um, experiments back in that part of the space station. One's called Albedo that takes a look at the uh, what amounts to the whiteness of the Earth. It's basically the reflect reflective light that comes off of the planet below. He's going to be using a camera to take images of that. He's also working on something called relaxation, which is not what it sounds like. This actually takes a look at how plasma discharges affect the upper reaches of Earth's atmosphere. He'll be using a camera on that one as well. Down at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, the three remaining crew members of Expedition 33 that will be joining the current ones on board 
Oleg Novitsky, Yevgeny Tarelkin, and Kevin Ford are undergoing final training and uh, final procedures as they get ready for their upcoming launch, which will take place on October 23rd. That launch time is scheduled for 5.51 a.m. Central Time. Again, October 23rd, 5.51 a.m. Central Time. Of course, we'll have live coverage here on NASA television of that. They'll be docking two days later on October 25th at 7.35 a.m. Central Time, 8.35 a.m. Eastern Time. Again, docking on October 25th at 7.35 a.m. Central Time, 8.35 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, we'll have live coverage here on NASA TV of that as well. Our coverage will originate from the Mission Control Center just outside of Moscow. Knapp drei Wochen vor der Präsidentenwahl in den USA haben sich beide Kandidaten einen heftigen Schlagabtausch geliefert. In einer zweiten TV-Debatte konnte Amtsinhaber Obama gegenüber seinem Herausforderer Romney offenbar punkten. Das jedenfalls ergaben Schnellumfragen. Anders als im ersten Fernsehduell Anfang Oktober zeigte sich Obama kämpferisch. Experten gehen dennoch von einem engen Rennen bis zur Wahl aus. Der Präsident auf dem Weg nach Iowa. Nach dem erfolgreichen Duell eilt Obama schon wieder zum nächsten Auftritt. Diesmal kann er zufrieden sein. Alle Umfragen sehen ihn als Sieger der Debatte. Angriffslustig geht Obama in die Offensive, wirft seinem Herausforderer mehrfach vor, die Unwahrheit zu sagen. Romney hingegen wirbt mit moderaten Positionen um die politische Mitte. Als er sich scharf von George W. Bush distanziert, sprechen Kommentatoren von Mord in der politischen Familie. Ich werde für einen ausgeglichenen Haushalt sorgen. Präsident Bush hat das nicht getan. Was Bush uns an Schulden hinterlassen hat, ist ungeheuerlich. Da stimme ich Obama zu. Nur der hat dann die Schulden verdoppelt. Ja, es gibt Unterschiede zwischen Gouverneur Romney und George W. Bush, aber nicht in der Wirtschaftspolitik. Romney ist bei sozialen Fragen viel radikaler als Bush. Das ist nicht der richtige Weg. Selbst die kritischste Beraterin des Präsidenten, seine Ehefrau, ist zufrieden. Obama hat zur alten Form zurückgefunden, hat klargemacht, dass er bei allen inhaltlichen Fragen von der Wirtschafts- bis zur Außenpolitik eine echte Alternative zu Romney bietet. Jetzt steht es wieder 1 zu 1. Obama ist ein wichtiger Punkt, Sie gelungen, aber nicht das entscheidende K.O. Drei Wochen vor der Wahl ist das Rennen knapper denn je. Unentschlossene gibt es nach dieser Debatte kaum noch. Beide Kandidaten müssen nun ihre Lager mobilisieren. Jede Stimme zählt. Knapp ein Jahr nach dem Tod des ehemaligen libyschen Diktators Gaddafi verdichten sich die Zweifel an der Darstellung der genauen Umstände seines Todes. Die Menschenrechtsorganisation Human Rights Watch hat einen Bericht vorgelegt, wonach Gaddafi und mindestens 66 seiner Begleiter misshandelt und regelrecht hingerichtet worden seien. Die Menschenrechter kritisieren, dass die neue libysche Regierung bisher nichts unternommen habe, die Täter zur Verantwortung zu ziehen. Die neuen Beweise der Menschenrechtsorganisation basieren auf Gesprächen mit Augenzeugen und der Auswertung von zum Teil neuen Videos. Rebellen, so Human Rights Watch, sollen Gaddafi und Dutzende seiner Leibwachen aus Hass und Rache hingerichtet haben. Die Menschen wurden massenweise erschossen. Wir gehen von mindestens 66 aus. Wir haben selber mit eigenen Augen äh, nur wenige Tage nach dem Massaker die Leichen dort gesehen. Die Menschen hatten Hände, auch das zeigt unser Video, die hatten die Hände auf den Rücken gebunden. Das deutet ganz darauf hin, dass sie nicht im Kampf gefallen sind, sondern dass sie erschossen worden sind von den Rebellen. Drei Tage vor dem ersten Todestag Gaddafis am 20. Oktober gerät die libysche Regierung damit erneut unter Druck. Der Vorwurf von Kritikern an die neuen Machthaber, sie würden die Milizen nicht entwaffnen, den Rechtsstaat nicht durchsetzen und es zulassen, dass ehemalige Anhänger des Diktators noch immer gefoltert würden, wie hier im Gefängnis von Misrata. Auch die Ärzte ohne Grenzen gehen von schweren Menschenrechtsverstößen an den Gefangenen aus. Die libyschen Behörden behaupten bis heute, Gaddafi und seine Soldaten seien vor einem Jahr in einem Schusswechsel mit den Rebellen gestorben. Videos wie diese deuten jedoch darauf hin, dass sie exekutiert wurden. Und das wäre ein Kriegsverbrechen. Nach dem Unentschieden der deutschen Fußballnationalmannschaft gegen Schweden suchen Spieler und Verantwortliche nach Erklärungen. Im WM-Qualifikationsspiel gestern Abend hatte die deutsche Elf schon 4 zu 0 geführt. Am Ende hieß es dann aber nur 4 zu 4. Es war das erste Mal überhaupt, dass die Nationalmannschaft einen derart großen Vorsprung aus der Hand gab. Die Körpersprache war eindeutig. Bastian Schweinsteiger war geschockt, 
So ein Spiel hatten er und die anderen Nationalspieler, die ungern über diesen Abend sprechen wollten, noch nie erlebt. Eine einstündigen Gala-Vorstellung folgte anschließend das große Chaos. 60 Minuten waren großartig, die letzten 30 Minuten im Grunde genommen unglaublich schwach. Zunächst Hochgeschwindigkeitsfußball wie im Rausch. Klose traf gleich zweimal und selbst Verteidiger Mertesacker wurde zum Stürmer. Leichtfüßigkeit und Eleganz, es war Weltklasse. Knapp eine Stunde lang, doch dann Man hat gesehen, dass wenn jeder ein bisschen weniger macht, dann reicht es nicht mehr. Gegner Schweden kam urplötzlich ins Spiel zurück. Das Anschlusstor durch Ibrahimovic schien die Deutschen noch nicht aus der Ruhe zu bringen. Doch nach dem zweiten Gegentor wenig später kippte die Stimmung die dfb 11 völlig von der Rolle. Es ist eine Kettenreaktion. Ich glaube, es ist einfach ein psychologischer Aspekt. Jeder macht weniger, denkt, es ist selbstverständlich, man wird oberflächlich, man gewinnt weniger Zweikämpfe, man geht weniger Meter. Selbstzufriedenheit führte zur sportlichen Selbstzerstörung. Der Vorsprung Schmolz war schließlich aufgebraucht. Der Abend von Berlin, eine kurze, aber bittere Episode in der Geschichte der deutschen Nationalmannschaft. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS update. It is Thursday, October 18th, 2012. This is a live view inside the Space Station flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. The Orbit 2 team is currently on console under the direction of Flight Director Bob Dempsey. This team is working with the Expedition 33 crew on board the International Space Station. They've had a very busy morning and are continuing to uh, have a busy day as they work on a variety of different experiments and also some routine maintenance work. Sunny Williams there on the far left-hand side. She is the commander of Expedition 33. She's been uh, replacing and refilling a recycle tank that is part of the environmental system on board the uh, space station itself. She also reconnected a uh, laptop computer that has been reloaded here recently and getting it plugged back into the station's network. She's also repairing what's called a turbine flow meter that is part of the exercise kinetics experiment. This is part of one of the experiments on board that takes a look at the human body and how it reacts to uh, being up in space. They're also spending the day replacing some uh, cabin filters, just like much what you would do here on Earth, replacing the uh, filters inside your house. They have to do that as well up on board the uh, space station itself, both for their environment and the equipment on board. She's got a training session today for how to uh, respond to a possible ammonia contamination. This is just part of a safety review that she is doing along with Aki Hoshide. These two crew members are getting ready to conduct a spacewalk the early part of next month in November, uh, the uh, first week of November. The exact date will be approved by the space station program, but these two crew members are going to be going outside to address an ammonia link that has been seen out on the uh, port side radiator, the P6 radiator that's out there on the far side of the station's truss structure. But they've been uh, this week going through different procedures and uh, reviewing the uh, items that they're going to have to take care of. They've been getting uh, their tools and their spacesuits ready inside the Quest airlock. And then, of course, once the uh, program itself, the space station program, uh, approves the date for this spacewalk, we'll have the update for you here on NASA television and also NASA.gov. Uh, Aki Hoshide has been uh, working on what's known as the aquatic habitat. This is basically an aquarium that is on board the space station that takes a look at how different uh, fish, specifically uh, the Madaka fish and things like that, uh, small, uh, they look like little guppies, uh, live up in space. We can learn a lot by how uh, small animals and fish uh, live up on board the space station, how their uh, own bodies react to being up there. So he's putting together that particular piece of equipment. Uh, they're fairly hardy fish, which is why they were selected to fly up to the space station. They have flown on the space shuttle uh, before, including back in 1994 aboard uh, Space Shuttle Columbia. But you see that uh, fancy aquatic habitat there that is uh, inside the Japanese laboratory. He's uh, about to kick off cleaning the what's known as the port crew quarters. This is the uh, sleeping quarters for the crew members. It's on the left side of the space station. He's been talking with ground controllers here in Houston about that. And Yuri Malenchenko, who is another flight engineer as part of Expedition 33, has been working a change out of a thermal loop panel back in the Russian segment. He's continuing to do that as we speak. As we talked about yesterday, the space station performed a reboost uh, of its altitude using engines back on the Zvezda service module. That went off as expected. The burn lasted 19 seconds and raised the altitude of the station 0 0.39 statute miles. That is to set up for the upcoming progress flight that's coming up at the end of the month on October 31st. 
as well as the launch on October 23rd of the next crew of Expedition 33 and their arrival coming up on October 25th. To remind you of our programming, here's the look at the crew that's coming up. On October 23rd, Oleg Novitsky, Evgeny Tarelkin, and Kevin Ford are going to be launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome down in Kazakhstan. That launch time is currently scheduled for 5.51 a.m. Central Time, 6.51 a.m. Eastern Time. They will be docking, as we said, two days later on October 25th. That docking time is scheduled for 7.35 a.m. Central Time, 8.35 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, we'll have live coverage of all of those events here on NASA television. Das FBI hat nach eigenen Angaben einen Bombenanschlag auf die US-Zentralbank in New York vereitelt. Nach monatelangen verdeckten Ermittlungen nahmen die Beamten einen 21-jährigen Mann aus Bangladesch fest. Er soll Kontakte zum Terrornetzwerk Al-Qaida gehabt haben. Laut FBI wollte der Mann einen Lieferwagen mit mehr als 450 Kilogramm Sprengstoff vor dem Gebäude in die Luft jagen. Die Ermittler selbst hatten dem Verdächtigen die vermeintliche Bombe beschafft, ihm jedoch eine Attrappe untergeschoben. Der Drehbuchautor, Journalist und Moderator Wolfgang Menge ist tot. Er starb gestern im Alter von 88 Jahren in Berlin. Menge prägte das deutsche Fernsehen über Jahrzehnte. Die Krimireihe Stahlnetz, der medienkritische Film Das Millionenspiel und die fiktive Figur Ekel Alfred stammen aus seiner Feder. Er war abonniert auf Sternstunden im deutschen Fernsehen. Der Klassiker schlechthin, Wolfgang Menges Figur Ekel Alfred, gespielt von Heinz Schubert in der ARD-Serie Ein Herz und eine Seele. Du langhaarige bolschewistische Jene, wozu ich abkratze und dir auch nur ein Furz hinterlasse, schmeiß ich eine Bombe und jag die ganze Bude hier in die Luft. Ein medialer Meilenstein, auch das Millionenspiel. Eine fiktive Show, in der ein Kandidat vor einer bewaffneten Meute flieht und eine Million gewinnt, falls er überlebt. Damit persifliert Wolfgang Menge den Fernsehvoyeurismus, der heute wohl wahrhaftig ist, doch in den 70ern noch nicht mal zu erahnen war. Wenn ich um See gehe, dann fällt mir das ein. Dann mache ich mir Notizen, ich habe immer einen Notizblock und da schreibe ich mir solche Sachen auf. Als Miterfinder der Gesprächssendung 3 nach 9 wirkte Menge dann auch erfolgreich vor der Kamera. Für sein Lebenswerk erhielt er 2002 den Deutschen Fernsehpreis mit der Begründung, dass er wie kein anderer das Fernsehen geprägt habe. Danke. Das war vielleicht das Schlüsselwort heute beim ersten Rededuell der Kanzlerin und ihrem Herausforderer Peer Steinbrück im Bundestag. Denn Danke sagte die Regierungschefin zur Opposition. Sowas ist ungewöhnlich. Aber es ging in Ihrer Regierungserklärung heute vor allem um Europa. Und da gibt es ja in Berlin praktisch eine große Koalition. Denn bisher stimmten Union und SPD immer gemeinsam für all die milliardenschweren Zugeständnisse an die Euro-Schuldenländer. Und wer weiß, welche Mehrheitsverhältnisse bei der nächsten Bundestagswahl herauskommen. Hans Jessen hat diesen Disput für uns beobachtet. Sie blieben vermutlich bewusst auf Distanz im Plenarsaal, die Kanzlerin und der Herausforderer. Zwei alte Bekannte trafen in neuer Rollenkonstellation aufeinander. Mit listigem Lob versuchte Merkel, die Angriffslust des Konkurrenten zu bremsen. Seine Partei hatte ja vieles mitbeschlossen. Trotz aller Gegensätze, die wir hier in diesem Hause haben, an den entscheidenden Stellen haben wir uns immer wieder zusammengerauft. Und dafür möchte ich einfach Danke sagen, dass das möglich ist. Steinbrück versuchte im Gegenzug auch die Kanzlerin mit Hinweis auf ihre Partei zu schwächen. Sie habe Griechenland Mobbing aus den Reihen der Regierungskoalition zugelassen. Anderen Christdemokraten wäre so etwas nicht passiert. Ich sage Ihnen, weder Helmut Kohl noch einer ihrer Vorgänger hätte zugelassen, einen europäischen Nachbarn derart für innenpolitische Händel zu missbrauchen. Die Beobachter erlebten eine ungewohnt offensive Kanzlerin. Sie, der oft Zögerlichkeit nachgesagt wird, warb energisch für Wolfgang Schäubles Vorschlag, die Rechte des europäischen Finanzkommissars zu stärken und kanzelte Bedenkenträger ab. Kaum hat jemand einen fortschrittlichen Vorschlag gemacht, eine Idee gegeben, wie wir mehr Verbindlichkeit, mehr Glaubwürdigkeit bekommen können, kommt sofort das Geschrei, das geht nicht Deutschland isoliert, wir werden das nie schaffen. So bauen wir ein glaubwürdiges Europa nicht, meine Damen und Herren. Ein fast leidenschaftliches Bekenntnis zum Verbleib Griechenlands in der Eurozone, das Versprechen weiterer Solidarität. Wie hätte Steinbrück da widersprechen können? 
seine Partei habe das schon immer gefordert, sagte er, und Merkel müsse jetzt zu den Konsequenzen stehen. Deutschland wird mit Blick auf Griechenland im Konzert weiterer europäischer Länder weitere Verpflichtungen übernehmen müssen. Sagen Sie es endlich, sagen Sie es endlich den Menschen. Die SPD war offenbar zufrieden mit ihrem Kandidaten, aber auch Angela Merkel genoss die Möglichkeit, sich durch eine Europadebatte zu profilieren. Ein lockeres Wortspiel über den Griechenland-Koordinator der Bundesregierung, Hans-Joachim Fuchtel. Er heißt in Griechenland, er hat es mir gesagt, Fuchtelos. Ich finde, das ist ein schöner Name für seine Arbeit. Ein gemeinsames Bild von Kanzlerin und Kandidat gab es nur als Montage auf den Laptops der Fotografen zu sehen. Realiter blieben die beiden auf Distanz. Nun, in letzter Zeit hatte Angela Merkel ja auffällig betont vom harten Los der einfachen Leute in Griechenland gesprochen und wie leid ihr das tue. Heute gingen dort wieder zehntausende Menschen auf die Straße und protestierten gegen die Sparpolitik ihrer Regierung. Es ist der zweite landesweite Generalstreik in diesem Monat. In Athen gab es am Rande der Proteste dann gewalttätige Auseinandersetzungen mit der Polizei. Und um Griechenland geht es zwar diesmal ausnahmsweise nicht auf diesem EU-Gipfel in Brüssel, aber der ewige Streit um mehr Geld auf der einen und mehr Sparen auf der anderen Seite zerrt an allen Nerven. Die deutsche Regierung mag von einem immer enger verzahnten Europa träumen, andere träumen vom Gegenteil. Und selbst die, die sich im Grundsatz einig sind, zanken sich um den richtigen Weg. Marion von Haaren. Nein, wir haben nicht gehört, was die beiden da besprachen, aber ihre Gesten verrieten, dass nicht alles rund läuft im deutsch-französischen Gespann. Angela Merkel und François Hollande waren sich nicht einig, wie schnell und mit welchen Prioritäten der Euro gerettet werden soll. Dies wird ja kein Rat sein, auf dem wir schon Entscheidungen treffen, sondern wir bereiten die Entscheidungen für Dezember vor. Es ist der uralte europäische Konflikt. Die Deutschen wollen erst die Regeln, die Franzosen das Geld. François Hollande hat sich zum mächtigen Fürsprecher der europäischen Schuldenstaaten aufgeschwungen. Im Moment müssen wir die Bankenunion voranbringen. Das steht auf der Tagesordnung. Mit Frau Merkel werden wir die nächsten Etappen der Währungsunion diskutieren, aber bevor wir das tun, müssen wir zuerst die Bankenunion voranbringen. Doch vor dieser Bankenunion stehen noch jede Menge Rätsel. So wie sich die EU das bisher vorgestellt hat, kann es rechtlich nicht funktionieren. Danach darf es nicht die EZB sein, die die Banken kontrolliert und es gibt weitere Fragen. Wir müssen klären, ob die Bankenüberwachung nur für die 17 Euro-Staaten gelten soll oder auch für die restlichen 10 EU-Staaten ohne Euro. Wenn wir keine Antworten auf diese Fragen haben, dürfen wir uns nicht hinter Zeitplänen verstecken. Die Kontrolle über das Geld. Im Juni hatten sie sie fest beschlossen, jetzt aber gibt es Streit um die Details. Auch Deutschlands Vorschlag, den Währungskommissar zum europäischen Superfinanzkontrolleur aufzuwerten, traf auf Skepsis. Wir haben genügend Instrumente, um die Haushaltsdisziplin zu sichern. Den Sixpack, den Two-Pack, den Fiskalpakt und so weiter und so weiter. Wir brauchen keine zusätzlichen kommissarischen Kompetenzen. Den Briten wäre am liebsten, wenn möglichst rasch wieder Geld in Europa fließen würde. David Cameron will den Finanzplatz London flüssig halten. Wir sind in einem weltweiten Rennen. Wir müssen sicherstellen, dass die EU wettbewerbsfähig ist. Das bedeutet Deregulierung, Kosten senken, Unternehmen unterstützen. Die EU muss mit den großen Wirtschaftsräumen Wachstumsmotor in der Welt werden. Für Cameron wäre es ein Grauen, wenn wegen der Bankenaufsicht die europäischen Verträge wieder aufgeschnürt und neu verhandelt werden müssten. Wenn wir nicht mehr alle einer Meinung sind, was die Substanz dieser Beschlüsse anbelangt, dann... Äh das, das äh, lässt das Gesprächsbedarf vermuten. Am Ende lächeln beide wieder. Die Bankenunion wird im Laufe des nächsten Jahres kommen. Erst dann kann wieder Geld fließen. In Syrien gehen die heftigen Kämpfe zwischen Regierungstruppen und Rebellen weiter. Und dabei gab es auch heute wieder viele Opfer. Noch einmal Susanne Daubner. Im Norden Syriens hat die Armee Luftangriffe auf die von Aufständischen gehaltene Stadt Maret al-Numan geflogen. Betroffen waren auch Wohngebiete. Mehr als 40 Menschen sollen ums Leben gekommen sein. Anwohner suchten in Trümmern nach Verschütteten. Am Wochenende wird der internationale Syrien-Sonderbeauftragte Brahimi zu Gesprächen in der Hauptstadt Damaskus erwartet. Er will zunächst für eine befristete Waffenruhe werben. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? 
And the International Space Station is ready for the event. Collect Spacecom, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is CollectSpace.com. How do you hear me? I got you loud and clear. How do you hear us? Yeah. Loud and clear. Um, great to talk to you this morning, Sonny. Thanks for taking a few minutes of your time out to, uh, to answer some questions. Um, and to jump directly into that, uh, you've been on board the ISS for about three months. If, and if I did my math correct, I think you're, you're within four days of your 100th day aboard, so congratulations. Uh, by now, does the station feel like home, or are you staying at someone else's home, or is it a really unusual hotel, or are you camping out at work inside a laboratory? Uh, it's definitely uh, our home at this moment in time. Um, you might see my hair has grown a little bit longer. I think I'm getting used to uh, being up here, and uh, the long hair is is good with me. So I think I think it's it's our home at this moment in time. You know, we have our little things scattered here and there, and we know where they are. And um, I think we have to clean up before the next crew comes here. Just like when you have visitors at your house, you want to probably take this weekend or the weekend before they arrive to clean up. Um, the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, recently had one of its characters fly to their version of the space station, which to their credit looked very much like where you're floating now. Uh, one of the comedic storylines story was that the character desired gravity after being weightless for so long. Have you experienced that? Um, for example, do you ever crave sinking into a chair? No, actually, I love being up here and I love floating around. And I think you know the mindset really is you know it's not going to last for every ever. So uh, um, you know I think you take an advantage of flying around as much as possible. There are subconscious things that catch you off guard, though. You know, and it took a little while to get used to falling asleep without laying down on a bed or having a pillow. Um, still, every now and then, you know, you take a a bag of nuts and go like this, you know, like hold it up in the air to fall in your mouth and that's not going to work. So some of those little subconscious things catch you off guard, but, um, you know, being in microgravity and flying around in space is priceless and, uh, I mean, I think uh, we're cherishing every moment we have of it. You'll be on space station until next month and that'll be just over four months and you previously spent six months aboard in, on a prior expedition. Um, NASA and its international partners have now approved uh, for a future crew to spend a year up there. From your perspective, what are the challenges you think that crew will face? Would you feel comfortable spending a year on station? You know, I, I would love to spend a year on the space station. It is a great place to live and work. And, you know, since this uh, subject has come up and uh, I've heard a little bit about it and heard some of the science objectives and things like that that are associated with it, um, you know, the International Space Station is a great place to live for a year. There's lots to do here. There's science experiments. You know, there's working on the house. You know, if every now and then something breaks. Uh, there's crews and it's dynamic, you know, changing crews. And so it would be really a, a good place to do that and if we're looking for the biological human side of it what happens uh, to the human body over that long of a time you know this is the perfect place to do that and we have all the monitoring here to figure out um, you know every step of the way what happens so yeah I would love to do it I know there's other folks in the office who would love to do it there's folks all over the world who would love to do it um, staying in space and looking at the planet for a year this close would be perfect well, on the subject of spending years in space, November 2nd will mark 12 years of continuous human presence on the International Space Station. Um, what, in your opinion, have we gained from the cumulative experience as it, as it applies to the future of space exploration? Wow, that, that's a great question. You know, I was um, lucky enough to be at the launch of the first expedition crew to the International Space Station. And so I can tell you just from personal relationships with people and uh, partners from all the different agencies, uh, we've come a long way. We've, uh, you know, of course we've trusted each other before in building the space station and throughout the whole process while it's being built. Uh, that's That has just been, uh, you know, capitalized on for the last decade. Um, as crew members, we've got to know each other really well. Uh, as, as international partners, we're sharing information and engineering ideas, learning from each other how other people tackle a problem. Um, I think that has just been, you know, uh, 
it, um, accelerated throughout this program. I think it's a role model program for many, many other international programs on the ground. And with that, you know, one of my own personal feelings is, you know, when you leave the planet, you sort of leave the planet as a human being. You don't necessarily leave it as a guy from this country or that country. And so hopefully, uh, you know, when we're going to other planets a little bit away from Earth, we'll be leaving as human beings. With regards to your time up on board already, uh, you recently had a SpaceX Dragon capsule and it's now famous ice cream delivery. And you and your crew are due a Halloween Day delivery by a Russian Progress spacecraft. Given that, were there any other surprise treats or tricks you found while unpacking the Dragon or treats you're hoping to find on the Progress when it arrives October 31st? Uh, well, that's interesting. Halloween is happens to be one of my favorite holidays just because it's a lot of fun and pe people act goofy and uh, you know there's always candy involved and so that's uh, it's it's exciting. So we're hoping um, that uh, we open the door and there'll be a little bit of treats in the progress. Um, but uh, sort of as a little bit of a surprise for me, I got a little bit of a costume from my folks for my birthday because my birthday happens to fall on. Uh, uh, National Talk Like a Pirate Day, so I think we'll uh, we'll all set we're all set for costumes up here for Halloween, and hopefully we'll get some candy. Looking forward to seeing that. Um, I understand you're preparing now for a spacewalk, your second during this expedition, but this one to repair an ammonia leak was not something you anticipated before launching. Uh, knowing the normal procedures that go through preparing for a spacewalk when training on the ground, is it substantially more difficult in undertaking to get ready for while in space? And how challenging is this repair task set out for you? Well, you know, again, a, a good question. Um, you know, the, it, it takes a lot of time to prepare for these things, but luckily there's a team of people on the ground that are doing most of the legwork to get it done. Um, you know, going into the NBL, other uh, astronauts are in the neutral buoyancy lab going through the procedures that the uh, EVA folks have developed and thought about for a long time about how they might handle something like this. Uh, we have the luxury of actually looking out the window, the cupola window, and seeing where our work site is and seeing how we might get there, as we call it, translate there. And, uh, and then with our group of folks on the ground, we review all of the procedures and understand what we'll have to do. Um, we also have equipment up here that we can sort of practice on inside some of the connectors. Um, and so we have a really good understanding about what the EVA is supposed to be like, but, um, you know, I always say it's not over till it's over, and uh, it seems like there's more things up here that surprise you than not. So our skills-based training, I think, is the, big, the biggest benefit that has got us ready for any type of surprise that we might have to handle and tackle out there, along with, the, of course, the talented group of folks on the ground who are thinking of every little contingency that might happen. You're right now commanding a crew of three, but you'll soon be joined by another three crew members. How eager are you for their arrival, and are there benefits for having just three people aboard the station and having that whole large laboratory to yourself? Well, it's sort of quiet up here, which is sort of nice, uh, with just three. No, we're really, seriously, we're really looking forward to the next group group coming up here. Uh, it always adds a little more dynamic uh, atmosphere when people are flying around. You know, uh, right now only two of us are living up in Node 2. Soon it will be four, so that means uh, a lot of traffic back and forth. But that makes it fun. Um, being, being a crew of three was really nice also, of course. It sort of calmed everything down, made things a little bit more relaxing, um, uh, even though we still had some dynamic ops. But we're, we're ready for our, our guests and the new residents of the International Space Station, Kevin, Oleg, and Evgeny. It's going to be great to have them up here. And um, like I said, we're cleaning house, making sure it's all ready for them. And as my time here runs out, let me ask, you know, launching with Kevin Ford and his crew are also 32 fish for Jax's aquatic habitat. Um, reading your blog, you seem to like checking in on the spiders that are now earthbound on SpaceX's Dragon. Are you anticipating the fish will take uh, the place of your uh, unofficial pets aboard the space station? 
Well, as a matter of fact, we were just looking at the, we call it the AQM, the aquarium, over in the Japanese uh, module yesterday as Aki was setting it all up, getting it all ready. So, and I was asking him all sorts of questions about it. So I'm, uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for uh, animals. And so I'll be really excited to see them and see how, you know, they change and they grow or how they develop and, and what we can learn from them. Because, uh, you know, the part of them coming up here is, is, of course, not just for our entertainment, but they are a science experience. It will be very interesting to see their skeletal growth patterns and what happens with their muscles up here and could and, you know, enlighten us to some of the things that are going on with our own selves. So, yeah, I'm psyched that they'll be here, and you betcha you'll, you'll hear about them in my blog. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time today. It's been great talking to you and seeing you in space. Thank you. It was always fun. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, Collect Space. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio comm. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS update. It is Friday, October 19th, 2012. This is a live view inside the Space Station flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. This is the Orbit 2 team that is currently on console, the flight director today is Matt Abbott. He is there in the blue shirt. Sitting beside him is veteran astronaut Anna Fisher. She is serving as today's CAPCOM, the voice of this team, up to the crew on board the International Space Station. On board the complex right now is Sunny Williams, who is the commander of Expedition 33. She's there on the left. Yuri Malenchenko, who is a flight engineer for Expedition 33, as well as Aki Hoshide. They are uh, busy today working on a variety of different science experiments, research activities, and also some uh, routine maintenance inside their living quarters. There's Sunny Williams there working inside the Unity node. She has been taking some surface samples today for what's called microbial analysis. We talked about this earlier this week. The crew takes various samples uh, around the complex, both of the air, the water, and the surfaces themselves, just to make sure that the uh, station is in proper working order and is in a good, uh, clean condition for the crew members. So she will take those samples and they will be uh, analyzed using the environmental health system uh, surface sample kit. She's going to be performing a checkout of the SAFER. This is the simplified aid for EVA rescue. The SAFER is sort of the uh, jet backpack uh, that the crew uses anytime they do a spacewalk. She and Aki Hoshide are getting ready for a spacewalk that is currently targeted for November 1st. This will be a six and a half hour excursion outside the International Space Station on that day to uh, take care of a, uh, an ammonia leak that has sort of increased here lately. Uh, but they're going to be mitigating that. That spacewalk will begin at 7.15 a.m. Central Time uh, on the 1st, 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, we'll have live coverage here on NASA television of all of that. Williams also has a ham pass today, a ham radio pass, with the Wattsburg Area School District, which is up in Erie, Pennsylvania. She's also going to be talking with the ground teams later on today uh, about that upcoming spacewalk, just reviewing the procedures uh, that have been scheduled for her. There you see the uh, bag that holds the safers that she is uh, working on right now. But they're going to be talking with the uh, spacewalk team here in Houston that has designed the spacewalk. They've been running... Uh, simulated spacewalks in the neutral buoyancy laboratory here in Houston just to time everything out, make sure that they have everything scheduled uh, for the crew. Again, it's going to be six and a half hours, and they're going to be going outside Aki Hoshide and Sunny Williams to take care of an ammonia leak that is on what's called the P6 radiator. This is the port side truss, the left side truss of the space station itself. There is ammonia that is circulated throughout those radiators that uh, helps cool uh, the areas of the station out there by the solar panels. There's another loop in the middle portion of the station that uh, circulates uh, fluids to help keep the actual modules themselves uh, cool, but this is not that loop. This is a secondary loop that is uh, out there on the end of the station's truss structure. Aki Hoshide is uh, sampling the air inside the station today, just like what Sonny Williams was doing with the surfaces. He's going to be performing a checkout of what's called the Multipurpose Small Payload Rack, or the MSPR Video Signal Converter, basically a camera system going to be setting up some cameras for the upcoming spacewalk. The two uh, crew members will be wearing helmet cams on the top of their spacesuits, which will give us up-close views of what they're going to be doing. And he's going to be installing some radiation environment monitors throughout the station uh, just to make sure that uh, the radiation levels there uh, are safe. 
Your Milinchiko also working in the Russian segment of the station, doing some different experiments there. He's been busy this week working on some Earth observation experiments, taking a look down at the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. So he will continue that. Meanwhile, the three remaining crew members of Expedition 33 are down on the ground at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. They are getting ready for their launch coming up on Tuesday, but they are undergoing uh, final checkouts and uh, some final procedure reviews as they get ready for that Tuesday launch. Their Soyuz spacecraft is going to be taking them up into space, which is the TMA-06M. It was encapsulated inside the upper portion of that Soyuz rocket today. The rocket itself is going to be mated tomorrow, and then Sunday will be rollout day, and then Kevin Ford, Oleg Novitsky, and Evgeny Tarelkin will get ready for their launch coming up on Tuesday morning. Three weeks after its grand arrival at Los Angeles International Airport atop a NASA 747 shuttle carrier aircraft, Space Shuttle Endeavour began the final leg of its journey, a two-day, 12-mile parade through the streets of LA to the California Science Center. Endeavour's route took it past several well-known landmarks, was captured from above by the Goodyear blimp, and was witnessed by thousands upon thousands of Angelinos who came out for a peek at NASA's youngest space shuttle. In a city where celebrities are everywhere, Endeavour's role through the neighborhood was the star attraction. This is the most exciting thing. I missed it when it landed, so I'm just so happy I could be here to see it make its journey. This is unbelievable. I'm an educator, so I'm always looking for history-making events, and it's only gonna happen once, so I had the time. Why not? The California Science Center plans to open its space shuttle Endeavour display to the public on October 30th. Start. Powering more than 100 successful flights, NASA's RS-25 engines were the workhorses of the Space Shuttle program. Now these engines will help power the core stage of the agency's advanced heavy lift rocket, the Space Launch System. SLS engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center are working on enhancements to its engine controller unit. The device exchanges data between the engine and the rocket and monitors engine performance. United Launch Alliance has reached the final milestone in its development of a commercial spacecraft for transporting astronauts to low Earth orbit. Technical experts from ULA and NASA completed their assessment of whether ULA's Atlas V rocket launch hardware would keep the crew safe during launch and ascent. Two of three newly funded NASA commercial crew partners, Boeing and Sierra Nevada, will use the Atlas V as their launch vehicle. All of NASA's industry partners, including ULA, continue to meet their established milestones in developing commercial crew transportation capabilities. The mock-up of Boeing's CST-100 spacecraft was put through water landing tests at Bigelow Aerospace Headquarters near Las Vegas. Engineers dropped the capsule-shaped test article from a crane into an outdoor pool to determine if the airbags will stabilize the capsule during landing. The tests are part of Boeing's ongoing work with NASA to develop a vehicle that can ferry astronauts between Earth and the International Space Station. Meanwhile, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, Expedition 3334 Soyuz Commander Oleg Novitsky of the Russian Federal Space Agency, NASA Flight Engineer Kevin Ford, and Russian Flight Engineer Evgeny Tarelkin continue readying themselves for their launch to the International Space Station scheduled for this Tuesday. Their pre-launch training regimen consists of performing generic flight plan reviews and familiarizing themselves with their Soyuz spacecraft. On board the station, Expedition 33 Commander Sonny Williams of NASA, Flight Engineer Aki Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Russian Flight Engineer Yuri Malenchenko continue with their daily activities including the transfer of supplies and materials from the SpaceX Dragon cargo craft that arrived at the orbiting laboratory on October 10th. Dragon is scheduled to remain at the station until October 28th. Hello, my name is Bettina Pavri, Payload Downlink Coordinator, and this is your Curiosity Rover Update. 
curiosity continues scooping at Rocknest this week. The mast cam and nav cam instruments provided images and video used to assess the success of the scooping and sample processing activities. These images also provided confirmation that the sampling system was successfully cleaned after the process was completed. Also this week, a soil sample was dropped off to the rover's observation tray for assessment by the science team. This sample was determined to be suitable for drop-off to the Kemen instrument. The Kemen instrument uses x-rays in order to image the sample and determine what minerals make it up. This helps geologists understand how the rock formed and how it's related to other rocks we've studied so far on Mars. Scientists identified numerous bright grains in the soil because of the small piece of plastic from the landing event that had been found earlier in the week, the team proceeded cautiously, dumping the second scoop collected and imaging the bright grains. These bright grains were later determined to be components of the Martian soil, and therefore the sample was deemed to be suitable for delivery to the Kemen instrument for analysis. The science team requested MassCam and NavCam mosaics of the outcrops in the direction of Glen Elk to plan Curiosity's journey to this next science destination. This has been your Curiosity rover update. Please check back for future reports. NASA engineers, students, and amateur radio enthusiasts around the world are listening for signals from TechEdSat. The small cube-shaped satellite was launched from the International Space Station into low Earth orbit to evaluate, demonstrate, and validate new technologies for future experiments aboard small space satellites. TechEdSat was developed by interns from San Jose State University with mentoring help from employees at the Ames Research Center. It's just great to get real science out of really small CubeSats, and it's really, it's not something that, you know, 23-year-olds like myself are often able to do. And I think it's really a, a great honor and a privilege. Dr. Nancy Grace Roman, NASA's first chief astronomer and the first woman to hold an executive position at the agency, spoke about the origins of NASA's astronomy program during a recent History Office lecture at headquarters. NASA was a great place to work. I started with NASA when it was six months old. It was a great place to work in the early days. In the first place, most of the technical staff were the cream of the NCA engineers. Great group of people. Everybody was enthusiastic. Roman was instrumental in the success of several astronomical satellites, including OSO, the orbiting solar observatory, the Cosmic Background Explorer, and the Hubble Space Telescope. Four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of Columbia on an ambitious 10-day international research flight. 20 years ago, on October 22, 1992, Space Shuttle Columbia began its nine-day mission on STS-52. On board, Commander Jim Weatherby, Pilot Michael Baker, Mission Specialists Charlie Veach, Bill Shepard, and Tammy Jernigan, and Payload Specialist Steve McLean of Canada. Copy, we see the fire. As well as deploying the Laser Geodynamic Satellite 2 and conducting several international experiments, Columbia also carried to space ashes of Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry. Eleven years ago, on October 24, 2001, the Odyssey spacecraft reached Mars to study and map the elemental composition of the planet's surface and evaluate radiation in the Martian environment. Odyssey also was a communication relay for most of the data sent home by the Phoenix lander and the Mars rover, Spirit and Opportunity. It also became the middle link for continuous observation of Martian weather by NASA's Mars Global Surveyor and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. In 2010, Odyssey became the longest serving spacecraft at the Red Planet. One. No, two, one, or two. Auto, auto. And five years ago, on October 23rd, 2007, Discovery lifted off on STS 120, the 23rd shuttle mission to the International Space Station. Delivering the Italian built Harmony Node 2 module was Commander Pam Melroy, pilot George Zamka and mission specialists Scott Parazinski, Doug Wheelock, Stephanie Wilson, and European Space Agency astronaut Paolo Nespoli from Italy. 
Swapping places with Clay Anderson aboard the ISS was astronaut Dan Taney. Mel Roy and Station Commander Peggy Whitson became the first two female mission commanders in space at the same time. The work now underway on board the International Space Station is designed to support deep space exploration in the future and provide benefits on Earth today. The Expedition 33 crew members are working on experiments in astrophysics and Earth science, in education and in technology development, and in human physiology and performance. There's a myriad of things that are going on, you know, not only U.S., but European, uh, Japanese experiments. Uh, there's experiments from all over the world that we'll be doing and hoping help some of the uh, human research that's going on. A top priority is learning how a prolonged stay in space affects the human body. Some of the data is gathered from observing how crew members operate in microgravity. Some of the data is gathered in the form of biological samples from the crew that will be examined on the ground after the flight. We will study the bone tissue pre-flight and post-flight. We'll perform blood tests. It's a large area for research. At the same time, throughout the mission, the crew members spend time each day in practical application of the best theories about how to counteract the negative effects of living in space, trying to prove concepts that will keep deep space explorers of the future healthy on missions that will last for years. This work also contributes to the station crew members' overall health and physical fitness, so they're better able to work with all the other experiments on board, including some that have a similar goal such as a study of the Madaka fish. The importance of these very small fishes are they have bones and muscles, just like human beings. So what we're trying to do is have them uh, stay in space for a longer duration and then uh, bring them down and then take a look at their bone uh, structures and muscles and see the effect of microgravity. The crew members tend to the operation of that experiment and other investigations going on in the station's several laboratories, serving as the on-orbit hands for earthbound researchers working in a number of scientific disciplines. And those kinds of equipments will be uh, acting as lab assistants. All kinds of media that have to be mixed and, you know, temperature has to be maintained. Certain time stamps will have to be kept and everything needs to be done with a lot of precision and a lot of attention to detail. This platform in space supports all of that research, plus a whole slew of experiments on the outside of the space station that are constantly gathering data without the assistance of the human crew members. For example... We have the gym uh, exposed facility that, uh, that has some even NASA payloads outside, um, for example, Maxi and X-ray, an all-sky X-ray detector on the outside. Uh, we're getting ready to take up scan test bed on HTV, which will go on like uh, an external logist logistics platform out there, and of course, alpha magnetic spectrometer sitting out on the starboard side as well. Taking advantage of being in space to gather information on cosmic particles for researchers who are trying to learn what the universe is made of and how it began. For all of the crew members, there is one other wide-ranging, high-priority task that must be completed so that these dozens of scientific investigations can proceed. And the task is uh, to maintain the space station in due condition so that all the units and all the apparatus perform as they should. And should any of those uh, break down, to be able to fix it. That means performing regular maintenance work being ready to repair hardware that breaks down, and possibly doing a spacewalk if needed to tend to the equipment on the station's exterior, although no spacewalks are in the plan for this increment. There will be a good bit of traffic at the space station late this year. Along with the goings and comings of three uncrewed Russian cargo ships, Williams, Malenchenko, and Hoshide depart the station in their Soyuz spacecraft in mid-November to conclude Expedition 33. Ford becomes commander for Expedition 34, and in early December, he and Novitsky and Tarelkin welcome a Soyuz carrying three experienced space flyers, station veteran Roman Romanenko of Roscosmos, and first-time station crew members, NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn and Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield. 
they will all be on hand to support the planned arrivals of two American commercial cargo ships, SpaceX's Dragon and Orbital Science Corporation's Cygnus, which are expanding the station's fleet of delivery vehicles. If they fly up underneath the uh, space station just within reach of our uh, Canada Arm 2 robotic arm. We'll fly over top of a pin and grapple that, that, uh, that vehicle and berth it to the, the bottom port on node 2 right under the U.S. segment and uh, have access to the cargo. Those cargoes, tons of food, fuel, oxygen and air, clothing, work supplies and science hardware are vital to maintaining the expedition crew members themselves and completing the mission of the International Space Station to prepare human explorers and their tools for the deep space exploration missions that are moving off the drawing boards right now. The ability of the humans to, to not only function in space but be very functional when they arrive at their destination, those are the kinds of things we're learning from the science fuel technologies, fuel transfer technologies, and uh, all the things we can learn about the space environment are all valuable to us for pressing on out. Why did you want to be an astronaut? My first inclination just was toward, toward flying and being a, being a pilot. Uh, I had older brothers who were interested in aviation my oldest brother, David, gave me a, a ride when I was about 14 years old for the very first time in a small plane. And uh, about the same time, I stumbled onto a book uh, called Carrying the Fire, written by Michael Collins. And it, it was the first book I ever read, and I s turned right back to the first page and just started reading it again because I just enjoyed it uh, so much, and I was fascinated by the things he talked about. And uh, at that point, as a, as a boy in, you know, small town Indiana, I just thought, boy, I just would really love to be a pilot as a, as a career. So um, I started working in a grocery store. I, I happened to, uh, to have a grocer in my town who had his own airplane. And so he was really willing to give me a job, and give me all the hours I needed to pay for flying lessons. And so that worked out well for me. And, and I got my license early and uh, went on to, you know, to study aerospace engineering and to become an Air Force pilot. Uh, some, you know, some of it's just lucky kind of the way it works out, but I was able to fulfill that dream of being an Air Force pilot and a fighter pilot. And then uh, after some years of that, uh, like test pilot, test pilot is next. So I was able to combine, you know, the academics of the engineering with, uh, with the operational skills of flying and going to test pilot school and just kind of found myself in a position where NASA was actually willing to look at the application one day, and they looked at it a few times and put it away before they finally looked at it one time and said, well, we've already hired all the guys that were better than him. They're already here already. So <laughs> I was lucky enough to get into the Corps uh, at that point. So it just, it just started out with the fascination with flying, really, and uh, I was just lucky to get, get into the astronaut business. You mentioned you grew up in a small town in Indiana. Tell me about tell us about your hometown. What it was like for you growing up there? So a small town of about two thousand uh, people. Uh, just a, a typical small town. It was mostly agricultural. Uh, I, I lived on a farm literally until I was about five, and then we moved into the city of uh, to in, into the center of the small town. And my dad worked in the automotive business and, and in farming uh, both and. Uh, so uh, the friends there were all uh, people who had, you know, kind of the same, the same econ economic status and kind of, uh, kind of uh, ideals and stuff as I did. And um, it was just a, a nice little town. I, I went to kindergarten with the same kids that I graduated from high school uh, with, you know, uh, those years later. And uh, so it was a very close, close knit community, hard, hard working, and. Uh, kind of knew how to take take care of themselves I would say. Were you able to pick it out as you flew over it on your first flight? I was uh, not and the reason is because uh, we, we launched at about midnight from Florida and uh, one, one of the interesting things about orbital dynamics is uh, we, we had a, an orbit that took us into the darkness as we crossed the equator northbound and into the daylight as we crossed the equator southbound for the whole two weeks. So even though the Earth is rotating underneath you, uh, everything we saw in the northern hemisphere was dark and, and, and lit in the southern. 
So I'll be able to improve on that with a five month uh, stay on the space station. Uh, I could see, for, uh, for example, Indianapolis and Fort Wayne and Lake Michigan, Chicago, and tell roughly where it was, but I wasn't able to, uh, to pick out the town itself. And I'm, I'm hoping to be able to do that on my long trip. What is it about that place and the people that were there that you think helped make you the person that you are? Well, I think uh, they all they all thought you know you could you could carry your weight and uh, you were capable. Everybody you know gave you the benefit of the doubt. Um, if you you know if, if I wanted to work in the grocery store and go take flying lessons, there was somebody willing to give me a job uh, doing that. Um, everybody's uh, um, pretty hardworking ac academically and everything. The school the school was a good example for me academically and uh, just kind of. Uh, you know, was willing to boost me out of the nest when the time comes to send, to send me off to college. And uh, it was good to have uh, um, role models. Uh, I knew a lot of the other parents, you know, my, my, because I was there with them, uh, you know, all my, all my adolescent life there, I got to know a lot of the parents of the kids and brothers and sisters. And um, I think all the, those influences, that stability was a, was a good thing, was a good thing for me. You touched on a couple of the high points. Let me ask you to fill in some of the, the meat on the bones of your education and then your professional career as you, as you left small town Indiana that, that led you ultimately to become an astronaut. So you want me to kind of head through yeah. uh, after my high college school. career after yeah. high school, all the way back to there, huh? That was a few years back. Uh, so I kind of I kind of came out of there. I had a pilot's license actually when I graduated from high school, just just because that was that was my thing. That was kind of my little dream, and I uh, I applied for uh, ROTC scholarships and uh, was able to was able to get uh, an ROTC agreement to go uh, to go to the university and then right into an Air Force commission after that. So I went to Notre Dame. I majored in aerospace engineering there, so it was a, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of things to learn about flying in the engineering field too that that weren't included in just you know getting say a private pilot's license. So, kind of just continued uh, that track. After that, I went to Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi and became uh, became an Air Force pilot. Went through the T-37 and T-38 curriculum. It's about a year, and uh, after the pilot training, then I got assigned to an F-15 in Germany. Um, between the time you graduate and you actually get there, there's there's more fighter lead-in training, and then there's some F-15, uh, what specific. we call the place the specific training, just learning about the airplane in Arizona that I did, and some survival training and some water and some, you know, uh, POW training and stuff. So about a year later, then I finally got to Germany and flew F-15s in Germany uh, for three years. You know, the height of the it was 84 to 87, so. Um, kind of the height of the Cold War kind of, kind of time. Never saw myself in the future flying in a Soyuz at that, at that point, I'll tell you that. And uh, after that, went to Iceland and flew uh, in the 57th Fighter Interceptor Squadron in Iceland uh, for a couple years. Uh, several times uh, joining up on the wings of Soviet bears, uh, bear bombers, as they crossed and worked in the North Atlantic. So uh, that, was, that was interesting. After that, I went on to test pilot school then in uh, California at Edwards Air Force Base. And after test pilot school, that's a one-year program in 1990, I went uh, back to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, back out to the east, and did weapons development testing there for about three and a half years. So the weapons, uh, weapons testing is, is never boring. We had a lot of really early morning takeoffs out over the sea and doing, doing a lot of tests on the things that didn't work right about maybe 25% of the time. And that, and that was our job, to see if, if we could make them work right. So, so that was a very in interesting job there. Um, I took a kind of a strange turn after that. I, I was uh, made aware of a possibility of going to get a PhD in aerospace engineering at the Air Force Institute of Technology. And uh, I had to kind of make a, a tough little decision there about whether I wanted to go do that or not. And uh, after giving it some thought, I decided to go ahead and do that. So I went to the Air Force Institute of Technology, spent three years there doing a, a PhD in astronautical engineering. And then following that, went to the Air Force Test Pilot School as an instructor. And I stayed there as an instructor. Uh, it, was a, it was a really great job there, but I was coming up on the end of it anyway when I came to NASA. So the timing worked out well, but uh, at the time I was 
uh, flying gliders with students up into Hatchapi on usually one day a week, and the other days I was flying the F-15 and the F-16 teaching students uh, flight test techniques at Edwards Air Force Base. So that was the last job I had uh, just before coming to NASA. To fly in space, as you're doing now, is to take on a job that has risks associated with it that most people don't ever have to face. Some people would ask you why you do it. I'm going to be one of them. Tell me, what is it that you think that we, we all of us, what do we get or, or learn as a result of flying people in space that you think makes it worth taking that risk? Well, I think ultimately people want to go to space, you know, and so to, to, to get out there, somebody's just got to head that way and, and put it to the test at some point. Just, just like when, you know, we expanded across the country and really went to all corners of the earth. I think it's in our human nature to, to want to do it, you know, yourself as a person, uh, no matter how many times you go to somebody else's slide presentation about their trip to Paris, it's not the same as getting your family, making a big investment in airfare and time off and really going out there and experiencing that um, because we really are all about the human experience. So uh, that's, you know, that's what takes us there. I think an interesting little piece of information is that when, if you if you ask somebody you know about the first time we went to the moon, few people think about the robotic missions to the moon that preceded uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Mike Collins going to the moon. They usually just jump right to the the point where oh we finally got to the moon. When in the in in reality we had several robotics missions, the U.S. wasn't even the first one to the moon robotically. So they don't really think about those. Now, those robotic missions are super important to us and they teach us how to get there. But I think that the human, the emotional connection comes about because uh, we, we see ourselves out there, we project ourselves out there and, and we really wanna go explore on our own, have a look with our own eyes. You're getting ready to launch to the International Space Station for expeditions 33 and 34. Kevin, what are the goals of your flight, and what are your jobs going to be in space? Well, um, of course, uh, the, goal, the goal of the flight is just to, to fly a safe and productive flight and uh, carry out you know, the, the plan that the increment managers put out there for us. Uh, we have uh, a lot of visiting vehicles uh, that will come and go. It could be like up to, including our arrival and departure, maybe like 13 traffic movements in, uh, 15, uh, in 150 days, so just uh, like one one every 12 days, and that adds, that adds a lot of overhead to the flight. Um, we have, uh, we have the, the robotics involved in some of the tracking captures of the new vehicles to look forward to, so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of something we're anticipating. And of course, the progress is uh, coming and going and uh, taking, taking care of the space station. Uh, all the purpose of that is really to get the, the, get the science going. Uh, it's, uh, now we're in the use, utilization phase and getting the science uh, rolling at full speed. So we've done a lot of preparation in anticipation of the science we're gonna be doing. Uh, I'll fly up on October 15th, uh, departing from Kazakhstan with uh, Oleg Novitsky and uh, Yevgeny Torelkin. And we'll go up and join Sonny Williams and Aki Hoside and Yuri Malinchenko, uh, who have been on board already as part of Expedition 33. And then unfortunately, uh, the, some delays uh, in, in some previous flights have, uh, have made it so that the overlap with them is only about three and a half weeks. So we'll have a pretty intense period of handover uh, in there with 33. And then we'll be a three-man crew, uh, Expedition 34 three-man crew for about three and a half weeks. And then uh, welcome aboard uh, Chris Hadfield, Tom Marshburn, and Roman Romanenko uh, for the 34, uh, Expedition 34 six-man phase, which sometimes we call 34-6. Nowadays, the new new lingo, and we'll stay until March. So, uh, the, the the goals uh, we've got uh, some space station uh, maintenance activities planned, some some kind of uh, periodic maintenance uh, that we've uh, we've trained for. But uh, really, the emphasis will be on getting getting the science rolling and uh, getting as much utilization out of the flight as we can. You've seen this space station before. You were there on your first flight. What are you looking forward to about the space station this time around? Well, uh, when I was there before, third, let's see, Node 3 was not there yet. And of course, uh, with that, the cupola was not there. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I think, though, that I'll also look at the space station in a whole new way this time. I was uh, a pilot on Discovery on my first flight. And as a, 
as a space shuttle crew member, you have a lot of emphasis on the shuttle aspects of the flight and the very, uh, the very high, high tempo of the shuttle visit. And uh, you don't really get to appreciate all that the space station has to offer. In fact, while, while you're visiting there, they kind of bring things down to a level so that they can accommodate you as a visiting crew. And you don't really get to see what it's like to, to live there and work there day to day. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the extended stay there as well. As a, as a shuttle visitor, you have very, very little spare time. You can measure it literally in hours, a small fraction of a, of a whole day of free time while you're docked. So I'm looking forward to some, uh, some Sunday afternoons, uh, seeing the whole planet and doing some things I didn't get to do before. And I should mention also that uh, this flight will be in a Soyuz, which uh, for me is a very exciting thing. I was uh, a pilot and test pilot as a profession before coming to NASA and uh, it was fantastic to get to experience the space shuttle. Uh, but I, I have to tell you too that I'm really looking forward to seeing the way a Soyuz operates. It, it's a whole different way to skin the cat to get you to space station and get you home. The rendezvous is very different. Uh, the flight en route is very different and the trip home is very different as you can imagine. So I've, uh, I've really, uh, really loved learning about the Soyuz and I'm looking forward to, to that aspect of the flight as well. The, the flight, not just the Soyuz aspect, but a lot of it, is it's going to be an excitement to be involved in a project that's making use of the expertise and assets from people all over the world. Yeah, the the space station. It's it's a this is a great point. The space station is really a, a huge, very unique cooperative effort uh, between all these countries. We. We, we do a lot in the, we got the Olympics coming up, for example, which is, which is a, uh, an international thing, but it's, it's more, you know, it's a competitive event between nations. And this, this space station uh, really represents, uh, to me, the very first big cooperative effort between the most affluent nations on this planet uh, coming together to do something all toward one goal. And uh, the space station, uh, because it's made up of uh, components from ESA and from JAXA and the Canadian Space Agency, Roscosmos and NASA. Everybody has a piece of this puzzle. Um, for example, the United States provides power, almost all the power for the space station. We provide this very uh, awesome S-band and KU-band comm assets, which all the partners use. By the same token, when we want to reboost, the Russian segment provides us with a reboost to space. They provide progress and, of course, crew transportation at the moment to get us there. Uh, the Canadians have built the Canadarm2, which allows us to accept these visiting vehicles now, this new generation of uh, commercial visiting vehicles that we have coming aboard. And uh, the science in the, in the Japanese Kibo and Columbus is absolutely, uh, you know, it's, it's world-class science, if you can call it that, since it's off the world. But, uh, it's absolutely very classy, uh, very classy space station, and I'm really proud to be part of that with all these uh, these partners. You mentioned a couple of the the pieces. Uh, fill us in on the rest of what is there right now. So the scene, if you will, that you're going to so, arrive at. Yeah, the scene right now is uh, space station. Uh, you know, is is really all put together. The Russians are getting ready to launch. Uh, I think Nuka maybe uh, through it in a year's time or so, and we'll add one more research module, but. We've got uh, essentially uh, 13 or 14 components, depending on you know exactly which ones you count up there right now. Uh, we have um, on the U.S. side the major laboratories conducting the research. We have Destiny and we have Kibo on the Japanese side, and we have Columbus on the European side. And uh, those are the internal internal you know modules where we conduct experiments. On the Russian side, they do a lot of their research in uh, the service modules, Vezda. And they also do some in, uh, in Rosviet and Poisk as well. So they have a few uh, smaller research modules to sprinkle their, their science around. So that's where we're getting all the bulk of the research done interior to the space station. Of course, we have some habitation uh, uh, available to us now. Node, node 1 is where we do a lot of the habitation functions. We exercise now and, and we use the restroom and that sort of thing in Node, node 3. That's where the regenerative eclis mostly uh, is living nowadays too for, for, um, for our environment uh, control. And uh, um, let's see, what else uh, we have um, on the exterior of the space station now, we have a lot of platforms that have science on them. We have the gym uh, exposed facility that, uh, that has 
some even NASA payloads outside, um, for example, Maxi and X-ray, an all-sky X-ray detector on the outside. Uh, we're getting ready to take up scan test bed on HDV, which will go on like uh, an external logis logistics platform out there, and of course, alpha magnetic spectrometer sitting out on the starboard side as well. So the the whole thing is uh, is a is a big. Uh, is a, this big conglomeration of these plans that have come together for the last couple of decades now and all out there really, really getting some good science done. Um, I guess we got that airlock sitting over there too, Quest, just in case we need that. That serves a special function for us. We do do some maintenance and uh, keep the suits ready to go so that we can go outside if we want to. And I think that kind of that kind of is the, the big picture of, of the modules there. And, and you point out the, the, the pretty broad variety of apparatus that are there for, for science. Uh, how do you explain to people the potential for what new things might be able to be learned in all of those various uh, places? Well, uh, j just being outside the atmosphere, for example, is, is one step toward getting some science done with, with the X-ray observatory, with alpha magnetic spectrometer, looking at the space environment in terms of plasma. We're learning a lot just being out there. Uh, we're learning a lot just from the fact that we've built this thing. Uh, it's, it's an engineering test bed, if you will, for a vehicle that operates and exists in space. Uh, the types of materials we've used to build the space station uh, are important to us for when we uh, build a vehicle that actually departs, you know, Earth and goes way far away. Because it's nice to be here just outside our atmosphere. Um, we can make changes if we want, take things up, bring them down. We can send, uh, we have MISI also as an experiment, which is a materials for ISS experiment that sits outside. And we can put these things outside and look at how materials degrade or, or how, they, how they weather, if you will, the space environment. So we can learn a lot about being out there. Um, the, the biggest, you know, the biggest component in my mind still is the microgravity uh, environment though. The microgravity is just so much different than, than what we experience here on Earth. You know, from the time you get up in the morning, you cannot even open your eyes and you know where the gravity vector is and uh, the things you do in your daily life, things like um, just sh sh the reason you shake orange juice is because it, you know, it, it settles out into layers and that sort of thing. That, that sort of thing doesn't happen in space. It's just very many unique things, uh, the way convection works and those sorts of things that um, allow us to be in an environment where sometimes we can see effects that, that we don't otherwise see uh, down here on the planet. And um, they're, they're really stumbling on to some really interesting uh, things out there. Sometimes even in experiments uh, where they don't think they will, they might see a phenomenon happen and go after it and investigate it and learn a lot. So it's, uh, it's that, that really unique environment that is just completely different than down here on the planet. Now, one of the important areas of concentration in science is figuring out how that environment affects the human body. And finding out what the, the bad effects are and how you respond mm -hmm. to them. Give me <clears throat> two or three examples of the, the kinds of human life sciences research that you're going to be doing on this trip. Yeah, so uh, in, in addition to being working crew members, a lot of times we are asked to be subjects for experiments and they'll, they'll take a really hard look at us before we go, after we come home, see how we've changed. And then in some cases, uh, actually can look at us during the expedition as well. Um, I've had, oh, you know, probably tens and tens of hours in, in, in MRI machines and stuff to, to characterize my musculoskeletal system, uh, bone structure, um, <clears throat> spacing between vertebrae and those sorts of things, and then we'll look at those again when we come, come back. You can't have an MRI machine in space, but we do have ultrasound up there. We have a spinal ultrasound experiment we're doing where we can look at those distances and send the data back to the ground so that they can see how things change. Does it change early in the flight? Does it change constantly throughout the flight? And uh, that sort of thing. Um, another interesting thing is that as humans, we're kind of programmed to the length of our uh, solar day. You know, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. Therefore, your uh, circadian rhythm is, is forced to stay in tune with that. And one of the things they can look at in space where we don't have uh, that normal solar day uh, in orbit, then they can look at how our circadian rhythm uh, would like to flow in some cases with sleep shifting if, if we didn't have that. So um, several times in flight, they'll wear a holder monitor for a test, a holder monitor to just look at heart rhythms 
and also my, my, my activity in ActiWatch to monitor my activity in space. And then they can look and see how my circadian rhythm was, was impacted by sleep shifting and get some really good data out of that. <clears throat> One more I might mention is, uh, it's not on humans, but it's, it's for humans as an as a, uh, experiment I've been trained to do for, the, for, the, uh, Jap, for JAXA, which is looking at some Madaka fish who happen to have um, a, a bone similar to mammals, uh, the way their bone is created and lost. And we'll be looking at these fish in the microgravity environment, and uh, it'll be really great information for osteoporosis research. So that's, uh, it's kind of human science, but it's going to be done on the on the fish in this case. <laughs> well, now, from the point of view of somebody who has spent time off of the planet, one of the mm -hmm. few hundred people who have done that, give me a sense of what you think it is we need to learn about how people live in that environment to maximize our chances for being successful when we go out there, when we go further away. Well, certainly, like I mentioned before, we really need to understand the environment, the radiation environment, uh, the um, just, just uh, all, all the things about space weather and those kinds of things that we can learn. Uh, I think a, a really big one too is, is still the human, human health. Uh, if you're gonna go to, to Mars and come home with the, the current uh, you know, thruster technology and kind of uh, fuels we have, it's gonna take a long time to get there and a long time to come back. And I, I don't really think we're ready yet to, to go to Mars land and get out there and you know, really go to work yet. There's, there's some recovery time involved. We've made some huge, huge steps forward. We have uh, an exercise machine on board now on space station that has made a huge difference in the health of astronauts coming home in terms of uh, bone, bone loss and, and muscle density. But we still have a lot of things to learn, I think, about the neurovestibular and just kind of uh, sensory functions, how to, how to handle those. I, I'm doing an experiment too. It's, a, it's an early one called manual control where I'll fly just before the flight. Uh, I'll have a chance in a motion-based simulator to uh, land aircraft, to maneuver uh, a rover on a planet in a low gravity planet, do dockings on the planet and, and also uh, driving a, a car. And then I'll do that the day I come home. And they'll compare performance and then recovery time, get some idea of kind of what, what kind of hits we're taking in terms of, hey, you've been in microgravity now for six, six months, what kind of tasks can you actually accomplish safely? So all, all these things are taking us towards uh, humans being able to make this journey when you get to your destination, be very functional, get a lot of work done, be, be happy enough to get back on a spacecraft and of course come back to, to Earth at the end having completed the mission. Uh, maybe maybe one more thing too. You know, we're we're looking right now at uh, some uh, space refueling and fuel transfer capabilities on the space station. Uh, those will be important. Uh, you know, if from an engineering point of view, to to making those kinds of big leaps out to the other places too. So, uh, you know, almost everything we do on the space station, you could point to it and say that is going to help us get to Mars if that's the next step or or beyond someday. You touch on the point that I wanted to, to get you to. Uh, there are a lot of modules on the space station that are packed with specialized gear that supports scientific research in disciplines other than human life sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about a few of those kinds of experiments that you've been preparing to work on on this flight. Well, we have, you know, uh, it's, it's really a broad spectrum. Uh, I think from my point, I was a, an aerospace kind of a fluids engineer, so we have a lot of really engineering fluids uh, experiments. Uh, one problem we might have now on Earth is if you have a tank that's got fluid and, and air mixed in it and you want to, you wanna, and you're lucky in your car because your fuel is always on the bottom of the tank. We're not that lucky in space. We have to design a tank so that that fuel is always ready by the pump there to be pulled down the line and sent to the engine or to, to whatever kind of device it's going to drive. So the fluids research they're doing I think is very interesting. Um, so we have, we have some experiments set up to do that. Combustion experiments, we, we, all love, uh, we all love fire. I think all humans love are fascinated by it. And things burn differently in space than they do uh, down here on the planet with, uh, with the lack of convection and the different mechanism for feeding oxygen uh, to, the, to the flame. So that, that will can continue. Um, in, uh, in the Japanese uh, rack, also one of the things that will continue is a Marangoni experiment. 
which is uh, they can build a column of fluid very close, very similar to water between a couple plates that just makes a bridge in space, something you can't possibly do on Earth. You can, you, uh, you've seen the bubbles that we float sometimes in the cabin uh, just in a glob and we like to take our pictures with them and that sort of thing, but they actually do it in the rack. And then by changing temperatures at the ends of the plates, they get flow patterns inside of this water bridge. And uh, there are theories about why it happens, but, uh, but it's still being investigated and it can make a big difference uh, if it can be applied to spacecraft of the future and stuff like feeding pumps and that sorts of things. You just never know what you're gonna find. Sounds like a, quite a variety. There, there is a, a wide, wide variety. Every rack is, is, is different. And the scientists who've developed these, all these different experiments, uh, they come from all over the world too. Uh, what's it like for you to, to get to work with that kind of variety of researchers? Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, very interesting. I just had a, a briefing yesterday uh, where the, um, the scientists taught me here in the U.S. but flew over from Germany just for the express purposes of teaching me uh, about a certain rack. It's the material science lab and um, I'm gonna be doing some cleaning functions in there in that thing to get it ready for, for a follow-on experiment. So he came all the way over from Germany as a German national and came, came to teach me. In Japan, when we're there, uh, the weeks that we're training, they will come from all corners of the country to, to present to us their, their vision for their experiment. And of course, uh, for many of them, this is, this is their life effort, the particular research field. Uh, the opportunity for them to get to see it happen on the space station, uh, of course, really, really excites them and, and we get to be their hands. So you, you can see it in their, in their eyes and their enthusiasms. It's a great thing to get to meet them, to really understand what it is that they'd like to do. And we know that they would love to go do it themselves. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe someday uh, down, down the road, uh, we'll be able to get up there and back quickly and, and more, more, more uh, citizens and scientists can get up there and do their own projects. The station crew members have got other work to do apart from the science. You're the people who are there and so you're responsible to take care of the station itself. What's a day like for a crew member? What are the kind of things do you have to take care of? Well, uh, a, a typical day we, we, um, we go on a schedule. If it's just a typical kind of science day, we don't have a vehicle docking. That's all driven by orbital dynamics when it's going to arrive and when it needs to depart. So a lot of that stuff takes you out of the normal day. But uh, if, if everything is quieted down a bit and uh, you're just on a normal, uh, normal work week, we're gonna get up at 6 a.m. Uh, at Greenwich Mean Time. So uh, somewhere around midnight or 1 a.m. Uh, Houston time and start, start our day. And we kind of work a morning, a long morning shift and then an afternoon shift. We spend uh, a good deal of time. They give us, of course, some time for post-sleep activities and hygiene and that sort of thing just to get ready for the day, chance to have a bite to eat. And then uh, you have a conference with the ground, uh, having take a good look at, at the schedule for the day, making sure that if you have anything time critical, perhaps a ham radio call with a school at, the, at an instant you fly over, then you need, you need to be there at that, that point in time or it's not gonna happen. So you want to look at time critical events, things that are coordinated with the ground, make sure you fully understand the day. And um, gather up tools, uh, kind of say goodbye to your crew members because the space station is so big we can go to all the corners. Now sometimes uh, I've heard that you don't even see, see other crew members the entire day until dinner time again. So you, you get out there and um, you, start, you start turning the wrench in whichever particular rack you have and uh, keep an eye on the day. And, on a, on a typical day, they'll um, they try to assign six and a half hours of real no kidding. This is not preparation stuff. This is actually you're at the rack getting the work done. So um, and somewhere in there, a little break uh, for lunch. Uh, also, usually morning or afternoon, uh, the crew members uh, will have an exercise session, which is two and a half hours of exercise now. So that's what we're up to in terms of keeping our health and fitness. So that's, uh, that's worked into the day. Um, at the end of the day, you have another planning, uh, another, we call it a daily planning conference in the evening with, uh, with mission controls all across uh, the world and uh, talk about the way the day went, maybe a little word about tomorrow, and then some, some evening quiet time to catch up, maybe make some notes, uh, do a few of the things that uh, you didn't get a chance to do during the day, and, and then turn in at 9.30. And you're the ones that Lights are- out. <laughs> You're the ones who are responsible to 
<clears throat> to uh, hop to anytime something breaks. Yes, and it does happen. Yeah, it does. It does happen. Uh, thing things do break. Uh, ab absolutely un impossible to anticipate that. So I'm sure there will be a surprise or two uh, in the, in our expedition. Uh, some things that have uh, needed some work in history. Then, if something breaks on board, you might need to fly it up on a Progress, get a component up there. So there are a few things up there that will meet me when I get there that I've been uh, trained uh, trained to work on. Uh, one of them is the uh, high, high data rate, high rate comm system, a new comm system that will multiply by 10 the rate that we can push data uh, to the ground. So that's a big thing. More video channels, more audio channels, and it allows some commanding uh, through the KU band system from the ground up too. So uh, as you know, the state of the art in electronics is changing rapidly. So it's changed a lot since we first designed the space station, and this will be this will be a really big upgrade uh, to get that going. So um, I've had some training on changing out uh, heat exchangers and the airlock. There's, those are one of those is kind of like six, seven years that needs to be done every, every once in a while. And that, that's a couple days work. So yeah, you go around and pick up those, those kinds of cats and dogs and make sure you keep the space station in working order. You mentioned that the, the time that you're up there, part of it is called Expedition 33 and the rest of it's Expedition 34. And when it becomes Expedition 34, you become the station commander. Does that make your life different than when you were a flight engineer? Well, I'm looking forward to that time when Sunny is the commander and I'm a flight engineer, learning from her and, and seeing how, how everything is run. And uh, I know her very well, and uh, I'm I'm hoping that just every everything she does up there, I'm just so going to be so happy to do it the same way and continue. So I don't think we'll change station operations uh, one little bit uh, when Sunny leaves. Uh, as you know, my crewmates uh, are are all all could be commanders, uh, of course themselves. Uh, they're all you know self starters and very motivated and excellent technically and uh, very you know very friendly uh, to each other and everything so I, I don't really have a big job to do in, in terms of uh, running the shop my idea or my my primary you know um, my primary goal would just be to monitor the crew make sure everybody's happy with the tasks they have things run smoothly with the ground make sure you know if grounds concerned about something Try, try to help them come up with a plan to, to kind of get things in, in the normal again and, and make things just uh, run smoothly on board. I, I'm you know, tasked with uh, keeping an eye out for the safety of the crew, of course, and the safety of the vehicle, first of all, and uh, making, making sure we, we have no compromises on board. So uh, we'll, we'll do that. And uh, if anybody has any issues with anything, hopefully they'll bring them to me. And, and we'll find a good resolution and uh, get back to having the fun mm -hmm. that, that uh, we're really anticipating having. So, It turns out almost the exact middle of your time on orbit on this mission is going to come right around the Christmas and New Year's holidays. What are your <laughs> thoughts about being in space on those occasions? <laughs> You know, it's not it's not too too big a deal uh, for me. I've been in mission control actually on Christmas Day and had a chance to talk with the the crews on the holidays and and they love they love being up there. Probably the biggest thing is uh, asking forgiveness from our families, you know. But uh, they know how special it is, uh, how long we've waited to do this kind of thing, and uh, they'll they'll forgive us uh, this one time around. We hope to have, uh, you know, a, l a little bit of festivities on board. Uh, tried to plan ahead a little bit to, to have some things up there to make it seem seem like the holidays. And uh, when New Year's rolls around, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to uh, be well rested and try to see some fireworks as we pass through those midnight time zones around the planet and see if we can pick up any of that from space. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it'll I think it'll be fun. It'll be a nice little break uh, for the. The, the 32S crew, my two cosmonaut buddies and I, it'll be kind of about halfway between October, you know, and our come home in March. So it'll be a nice, nice little gap in there and we'll enjoy it. The plan for any station increment has to be flexible to accommodate unusual circumstances. You made a reference to that earlier. Uh, that includes the need for crew members to have to go work outside. Uh, tell me, as of now, What's mm -hmm. the space, spacewalk plan for your increment? Who would go outside and for what purpose? Great question. Still shaping up at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we are fortunate uh, with, um, with Sunny and Aki uh, right now during the 32 time frame, 
um, are planning to go outside and do EVA 18. So they've been trained to do that. Joe Acaba will still be on board at that point. And uh, if, if that all goes well and they've taken care of that, then um, we, inf we don't have a scheduled EVA in the 33-34 uh, time frame at this point. Um, Chris Adfield and Tom Marshburn have been training to do EVA 18 uh, tasks as well, just in case of visiting vehicles or some, some other, you know, maybe uh, Sunny and Aki will have to go out and do some other EVA for something more urgent outside. So if those tasks that they're planning to do haven't been done yet, then we'll do those in probably late January, February timeframe uh, with uh, Chris Hadfield and Tom Marshburn. And there are some robotics involved in that. And so my duties would be to suit up IV and, uh, and, and work in the robotics uh, for those two guys. At one time we had an EVA 19 in there. I'm hoping it comes back. At this point it hasn't. Uh, Chris Hadfield and uh, I trained for EVA 19 and then we've been uh, all the way through the EVA assessment and we're ready to go do that. It, it's uh, dependent on uh, SpaceX 2 taking up uh, a pair of like picnic size tabled uh, radiator grapple bars that uh, come up on the outside of SpaceX 2 and they probably will arrive when we're there but um, they, with, with the numbers of visiting vehicles, they've decided to go ahead and push that EVA-19 downstream to another expedition uh, further out. Uh, it would be taking those grapple bars off and stowing them on the back of the truss using robotics and uh, just putting those away. So, so that, one, that one left out of our increment. Uh, we are uh, all happy to go out. We are um, doing NBL runs and, uh, and training uh, in the virtual reality lab for all contingencies and uh, if the need's there, we'll We'll all be happy to step outside and, uh, and have a day uh, with a spacewalk. I think everybody yeah, expresses yeah. that opinion. <laughs> I'm ready to go. All yes. you have to do is ask. Uh, yes. The space station these days is getting supplies delivered by a small fleet of unmanned cargo ships. And as you made reference, there's maybe a half a dozen or so that could be showing up during the time that you're going to be there. Uh, tell me about those different ships that supplied not only the ships that come from the station partners themselves, but from commercial companies, including a new one, the, the Cygnus ship that might make its first uh, demonstration flight while you're there. Okay, uh, yeah, well, we'll just start out with the, the progress is the one that comes and goes the most often. Uh, when we arrive, uh, 48P will be, uh, will be there, and um, 49P will get there just, just after we've uh, arrived and, and docked to the aft side of the, of the Russian segment. And, and during our increment, 50P will come and go and 51P will arrive. So several movements of progresses on the progress docking points, uh, ports on the Russian segment. Uh, the ATV, uh, the European ATV is scheduled to have departed uh, before we get there. Uh, it's there at this point and HTV will have come and gone as well, the Japanese vehicle that goes uh, on the Nader Node 2 port on the Russian, or on the uh, US segment Node 2. So that'll be gone. So and then and uh, at the back end of our flight, there will be another launch of an, a European ATV, and uh, it will be in space when we depart to come home. But it won't have docked yet. So it will be uh, loitering at just a few thousand kilometers behind space station, waiting for us to get out of the way so it can come in and dock. So that's just luck of the draw. We won't see HTVs or ATVs with the current plane. So of course that that could always change. And we've had some pretty extensive training on those. Just just in case. So um, then the other uh, commercial vehicles that are just getting up and running right now um, are the Dragon, which has made one visit already. And there should be a Dragon on board space station when we dock with our Soyuz. And we should get the chance to see that on board and uh, be there when it's released and it uh, comes back to Earth. Um, further downstream, right now we're bookkeeping the possibility for another Dragon or orbital to come at a later date uh, downstream. So about the, about the December, November, December time frame, possibility of seeing uh, either one of those vehicles again. Those are both, again, grappled. Uh, they, they fly up underneath the uh, space station just within reach of our uh, Canada Arm 2 robotic arm. We'll fly over top of a pin and grapple that, that, uh, that vehicle and berth it to the, the bottom port on node two right under the U.S. segment and uh, have access to the cargo. So we, uh, we would love to see any of those. Of course, uh, the, the Dragon had a great flight last time 
And uh, one of these days, the Cygnus will get up there as well too, and it'd be great to be great to see both of those vehicles during and, during our flight. And you've trained mm -hmm. for that to to be the arm operator for yes. for those arrivals, right? Yes. Yeah. So we've uh, all of us get uh, a, a big big smattering of training, not only in the grapple itself, but the arrival procedures. We we do have a panel to command the vehicle from on board, so we can send it away if we want, or make it hold, and those sorts of things. So. Uh, we get a lot of extensive training on its rendezvous and its uh, its grapple and and berthing, so with with any luck, we'll get the hands on the controllers at some point and bring one of those aboard. The landscape of spaceflight has changed an awful lot in just the last few years. You got commercial companies flying, not just governments, and and you've got sovereign nations working together uh, in in cooperation rather than competing with one another. Is that a, a kind of a, a of an arrangement, a model that you see continuing off into the future? I think ab absolutely. I, I see no end to that. I think it's it's been really kind of a, of an evolution that uh, that we won't go back on. So um, some some of those functions, <clears throat> like taking taking cargo to and from low Earth orbit, uh, NASA has really developed well. You know, in the last few decades and. Uh, NASA is about sharing those technologies and, and making it so that we can we can do it cheaper and we can we can spread out spread out the tasking a little bit and allow allow NASA to go on and do a few a few other things that are really you know more cutting edge something a commercial company wouldn't wouldn't dare to invest in at this point we can do that with our our NASA research and then the the joint the international cooperation uh, I, I don't see that stopping either we've <clears throat> we've made uh, just so many, um, so many advances in um, being able to work it out. This is something you know. Just most people don't appreciate how hard it is in, in different languages and different cultures with different budgets and different national objectives and different national perspectives, even uh, to bring uh, countries together to make to make one thing like the space station happen. But I think now that we've seen it, um, our other big goals, our other big steps. Uh, out into the cosmos will be as a planet and not not just as a nation. What is it that we're learning on these missions to the International Space Station that's going to prepare us humans for the exploration of space well beyond Earth? Yeah, just every single thing we we do up there, whether it's again the material science for spacecraft uh, development, whether it's communications, uh, systems we have uh, on the HTV we have a, a, a very large payload going up called scan scan test bed and it's going to look at uh, a new way to make radios work in space uh, software defined radio technology so uh, we may be looking at kind of even a different concept in how we operate communications in the future um, again the the ability of the humans to to not only function in space, but be very functional when they arrive at their destination. Those are the kinds of things we're learning from the science. Uh, fuel technologies, fuel transfer technologies, and uh, all the things we can learn about the space environment are all valuable to us for, for pressing on out. Thank you.
You're in a good mood, that's good. <laughs> Добрый день, расскажите, пожалуйста, как прошел вчера ваш первый день тренировок, вы 
вы проходите как раз на мой экипаж и какие ваши настроения на сегодняшний день? Well, as you know, the training is very long path. It's about a two and a half year uh, path to get here. Uh, we did this about five uh, months ago as a backup crew, so we had a little bit of a uh, chance to see what these qualification centers would look like. But officially, this is uh, our very last day of training for uh, Yevgeny and Oleg and myself. So it's a, it's a big milestone for us. It feels very good to be here. Oleg. For you, which uh, simulation is harder on the Russian segment or here? Both are very important. I know that, but uh, which one is more difficult? Well, I would say Soyuz is more dynamic, more com complicated. Abnormal situations happen very quickly. You have to react quicker as well. On the station, it, you can afford to be a little slower. Sure. Okay, well, I wish you success. Tell me when you're ready for me. Ready? <coughs> Everything is great. Plan. Many. Is that all? Yes, let's go. 
Well, hey, how's everybody out there on uh, the USA uh, for NASA TV? I think the, we're doing this. Uh, so I'm here with uh, Oleg and Yevgeny, and we just uh, are six days prior to our launch. And a tradition is to, uh, all cosmonauts who fly out of the Cosmodrome come out here and plant a tree for their first flight. And since this is the first flight on Soyuz for all three of us, uh, we were lucky today and we all planted our trees together. And it's a great tradition. Uh, when we have a chance to return, hopefully someday I'll come back for somebody else's launch. Come back out here, see how my trees are uh, doing. Just like uh, we walk around and look at all the other cosmonauts and astronauts who are out here and kind of re relive the history of the Cosmodrome out here. So it's really, really a great tradition up and down all these walks to come out here and see really the history of space flight from the Cosmodrome here in Kazakhstan. Скажи, а вот были какие-то там пожелания с вашей стороны, когда применяли корабль? Что-то там, может быть, из них будет перегрели, если они туда делали? Ну, глобально, конечно, там ничего не поменяешь. Did you change something in the vehicle? Globally, you cannot change anything. But all crew members can have their own remarks, but in most cases they can fix that in themselves. We took some souvenirs with us, some personal items, and these souvenirs will be in space, probably. This is the most important one we took. Well, I've, I've just always loved things mechanical and doing things outdoors, and I started uh, flying at a young age, so I loved aviation, and uh, became a test pilot and an engineer, and it was just kind of the, the next step for me to uh, to apply to be an astronaut and of course I think there's there's not a more exciting job so to me it's just uh, it's the best job on the planet and off the planet tell me please about some um, little uh, fish uh, ah. uh, goldfish uh. they're fish but they're actually madaka fish uh, from Japan and they're part of a study in the Japanese lab Kibo that will look at bone loss and construction on orbit, osteoclasts, osteoblasts, and their bones are just like human bones or mammals' bones, so it'll be a very good study for osteoporosis, for bone loss in, in elderly people. Thank you. Kevin? Kevin? Can you tell us what kind of activity you participated in today and what's your impression of well, this is uh, the, our last chance to see the rocket all packed up and ready to go for launch day. It's already inside the shroud, and now they'll just lie it down and attach it to the front of the rocket. All of the, uh, the payloads are already strapped onto what we like to call the divan. It's, it's a big place on the one side of the bayo. They'll put all the, the loads in there, and they've filled up all of our food containers, and they've completely configured our seats and everything so it's ready to fly. So it's uh, our last chance to see everything. Uh, it looks beautiful inside, and uh, we're very satisfied with it and ready to go fly uh, in just a few days. Tell you about the Soyuz. Well, uh, today the Soyuz is all encapsulated now inside its shroud and ready to go. And uh, it's all loaded up for our flight. Our sea liners are in, and everything is put in place to fly. The special things we requested plus all the, the payloads that will deliver on 32S for Expedition 33 and 34 on there. So, all those time, time critical payloads. We had a chance to review and see where they all are so that we could get to them quickly and uh, get them in position in ISS for the mission. Uh, what about space team? Uh, about my space crew? Very experienced in the, uh, in the training environment and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them fly for the first time in the cosmos. They have all the skills they need and we uh, can get along like brothers. So uh, we are, we're really ready to go spend five months in the space station. We are like family members. We they're very close and finally the vehicle is ready, the crew is absolutely great. We were training together, so it was really really great. For the first time the vehicle had its name, Yuri Gagarin. It was named in honor of the 50th anniversary of the first human flight. The rescue team found 
some fragment in this step of Kazakhstan and then gifted it to our museum. Pavel, have you signed it yet? Yes, yes, some time ago.